And I see we are live on YouTube now. Um, Ms. Lotz, whenever you'd like to start the recording, I think we could probably get rolling. And the meeting is being recorded. All right, Chair Stallworth, I will let you call us to order and uh, let's get rocking and rolling. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, call this NIAA Realignment Committee uh, meeting to order on this Tuesday, November 30th, 2021. All right, Chair Stalwart, thank you very much. And again, Donnie Nelson from Yacht Staff, welcome everybody. We have got a lot of work ahead of us over the next uh, year and a half to put together a process for realignment starting in the fall of 23, going through the spring of 25. Appreciate all of your time, your, your dedication to the association, our student athletes, and trying to present as best as possible to the association a competitive situation where we get teams in the right places based on a variety of factors. And I think you all remember the, the process from a couple of years ago, but uh, here we go again. <laughs> you know, we're, we're through one season in the current realignment cycle and it's already time to start preparing for ahead. So um, before we do a roll call, just to make sure we're not a little bit out of compliance here, I don't, I don't think I am here. Um, to understand the people today, what we're going to try and accomplish, and, and that is to look at creating recommendations on the basic structure of our realignment process today. This is not to get into uh, what I would call the ground level of putting schools in classifications and arranging those schools in particular to lead to classifications. This is the overall structure of what we're gonna do with regards to a timeline, then to policies, and then to procedures. And whatever we accomplish here today, we'll look forward to moving to the board. Again, once we get in the timeline and talk a little bit more about that a little bit, uh, to the board in, in uh, the springtime. And whatever we don't get accomplished here today, there is the opportunity uh, or the necessity, I guess at that point would be that this group would have to get back together prior to the spring board of control meeting and finish up what's on our agenda here for today. So with that said, I appreciate that. I know that was a little bit out of the, the ordinary for the call to order, but I, I think that was appropriate to give a, a basic overview of where we are here today. So with that said, let me go to a roll call for us here. And... We'll start with our non-voting chair, Ron Salworth. Here. And our non-voting vice chair, Pamela Sloan. All right, Pamela will be logging on here at her earliest opportunity and convenience. Now going to our voting members of the 1A Central and East, Ken Higby. Here. From the 1A North, David Bick. Here. From the 1A South, Mike Strong. Mike, Mike, I see you on there. I, I see you're logged in. So I'll let you unmute when we get to that point. From the 2A North. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Mike. Uh, from the 2A North, Mike Brooks. Here. From the 2A South, Bill Darrow. Here. 3A North, Ray Parks. Here. 3A South, J. Dale Wilson. Present. 4A, 5A South, Ron Gearson. Here. 4A, 5A South, Kevin McPartland. Here. 4A, 5A South, Tim Jackson. Here. 5A North, Art Anderson. Here. And to our non-voting uh, voting consultants representing the private schools, Brett Walter. Here. Charter schools, Mike Kofer. Here. Mike, I saw you on there, there we go. And to our non-voting advisors, uh, Donnie Nelson, present. Bart Davis. Here. Lori Lotz. With this. Here. Thank you. And Paul Anderson. Here. All right. Chair Stallworth, I'm going to turn hey, it over Donnie, to Donnie, I'm here too, Donnie. Oh, oh Bobby. Bobby. Sorry, Bobby. My apologies. I, I did see you. <laughs> I just checked you off. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Northridge. Appreciate it. And uh, with that said, we'll go to, to item number three on the agenda. That will be the chairs and vice chairs uh, comments and announcements. So, uh, Mr. Stallworth, you are hey. first up. Thank you, Donnie. First of all, I'd like to to thank all the committee members for being involved in this, this outstanding task. Um, I'm gonna go back a little bit and uh, I, I joined the Nevada ranks as a, as a teacher and coach in 1985. And all of a sudden I've been involved now with the NIAA uh, officially as a member um, since uh, 2010. 
and my involvement has has been participating in committees and and and, and uh, interesting uh, organizations like this and, and and meeting different people and again now i'm on i th i want to say this is the third realignment committee that i've been on and i know some of you out there have more gray hair than i do had have been involved in the realignment a lot longer than i have uh, not going to say any names uh, mr jackson but as we uh as we go as we go through this we appreciate your participation and understanding uh, of what we of the tasks that we have ahead of us and as we go, um, as we continue to go through this, understand that no one in their right mind would have ever thought that we would be able to do what we did this last realignment cycle. I mean, we were completely outside of the box. And I want to just give you a little bit of heads up is as we move through this, we're gonna have to go outside that box again. And so if you have any ideas, if you have any thoughts and you're thinking, I'm just going to hold those back and I'm just going to wait, get them out there. The sooner we hear the most strangest options that we you could possibly think of, who knows, that might fit for one of these schools out here and, and for one of the programs that we have. So keep that in mind as we uh, as we go through this. And um, I want you to make sure that you're open, you're honest, and, and, and let us know how you truly feel and your constituents feel about what's going on so we can make this thing uh, even better as we go around. Uh, that's what I have. Is, is uh, Pam on yet? That's what I have, Donnie. Thank you, Chair Stallworth. Vice Chair, Vice Chair Sloan, welcome, Pamela. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Sure. Good morning, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And I absolutely agree with everything in which Rollins just stated. Um, this is unique. This is here we go another two years. And um, I think what we've gone through the in the what we're currently going through with the realignment has a lot to say to the success of the direction in which we're going. So with that said, but Donnie, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Ms. Sloan. Appreciate it. Uh, Chair Stallworth, we will move on to item number four. That is public comment. Would you like to read the disclaimer on there, the announcement to that agenda item, or would you like me to do that, please? I'll do it. Public comment uh, agenda item four. This time provides an opportunity for citizens to address the committee about a matter not on the agenda. Items raised during this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon until compliance with notice procedures of the open meeting law that has been uh, accomplished. Members of the public who wish to speak on the matter not listed on the agenda were instructed to contact Lori Lodge prior to the meeting to obtain the procedure for providing live public comment. Additionally, members of the public who have submitted public comment by email will have their email read into the record. A limit of three minutes per person and or five minutes for a spokesperson of a group will be imposed. It is requested that comments be directed to the committee as a whole, comments that are deemed to be irrelevant, repetitious, offensive, inflammatory, willfully disruptive, or deemed to be personal attacks will not be permitted. A, the time limit and restrictions just described will apply to email comments being read into the record as well as live comments. Okay, any of your locations, A out there, public comment, has anyone received an email? to be read into the record. Mr. Stoller, um, go ahead, Lori. Um, there are not any emails that were received, but we do have Mr. David Palmer from Dayton High School um, in the meeting now for public comment. Okay, good. So we have uh, Mr. Palmer from Dayton. You're on, sir. And David, we see you in there. I know your camera's not on. If you have the opportunity to unmute yourself, if you can hear us right now, please do so at this time. David, David, one more opportunity. We don't want to deny you this opportunity. I know you had asked to get in the meeting. Um, again, you're on mute still. I know your camera's off. I'm you're in the room. I hope you're present. I, if not, I, I want to be a little careful here in that 
Uh, Mr. Ray Parks can echo, I, I believe, what your comments were. Um, but again, at the same time, I don't want to do something that's, that's out of order for your representation. Uh, Chair, Chair Stallworth, let, let me give me one second. Let me see if I can uh, call Mr. Palmer real quick. I don't want to advance past this item and deny him the opportunity to make public comment. Uh, there is public comment opportunity also at the end of the meeting. But I, but I believe his time schedule was one that he needed to make that comment right now. So I'm, I'm going to mute myself. Please be, be patient with me, everybody, for one second. Let me spank it a hold of him, okay? Be right back. Are there any others while we're waiting uh, for that, Lori? Are there any other comments, any other um, public comments in any other location that's out there? I have not received any other requests for public comment. Okay, thank you. Oh, I see Palmer has his uh, camera on now. Oh, are Palmer? you are you able to hear me at this point? Yes, we can. Good. I, I apologize. I was having some technical difficulties on my side uh, getting connected. Um, I do want to thank all of you for uh, being here this morning. And um, if you will bear with me, I just have a brief statement I'd li like to read into the public record. Um, so I wrote up an email uh, last night, and um, if I could could uh, express my my thoughts. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first, I would like to express my gratitude to each member of the committee for the hard work uh, they are about to embark upon. I fully appreciate uh, that the decisions uh, that you'll be making in the coming months will have a significant impact on the shape of athletics in the state of Nevada in the years to come, and would like to express my gratitude for the time and effort that will undoubtedly be expended in finding the best alignment possible for all member schools in our organization. With this being said, I'm writing to express the Dayton High School would like to again petition for realignment into the 2A for football only. In discussion with coaches and community members, there's again been a suggestion that we would again petition for a move for all of our programs. However, in discussion with several key actors within the process, the Dayton administration has come to, real, to the realization that there is little, if any, support for this action. And taking a balanced view of the situation, the Dayton administration finds that while Dayton would always like to find a more advantageous alignment to increase our competitiveness, competitiveness in league play, the truth is that the majority of Dayton's programs compete on an even field in a safe and respectful environment. Football, however, continues to be a different story. While I can in no way express the gratitude I have for the, both the NIAA and the 3A League for their support and rebuilding of the Dayton football program, it is the general feeling of my staff and the re, uh, it is the general feeling of my staff that the recent uh, readjustments to the 3A League have continued to negatively impact Dayton's competitive stance. And there is a general belief that no amount of work in the program will allow us to bridge, you, bridge the continued growth in disproportionate program sizes. A brief example of this disproportionality being the in-league score average for this past se uh, season being at 52 to three. Furthermore, continued participation in the 3A poses serious health risks to our players where season ending injuries were sustained by Dayton players in nearly every league game. It is my strong belief that we will be in serious jeopardy of permanently losing our program if we are unable to figure out a more competitive stance, at least in the short term. My primary motivation in writing this letter is to determine what next steps should be in the realignment process. State administration will gladly appear before this committee to pre present any detailed evidence the committee uh, would like to see uh, of this continued disproportionality that was mentioned above and is further willing to accept suggestions from this committee uh, that would help to mitigate our situation. Thank you in advance for your consideration of this matter. We look forward to an opportunity to continue the discussion. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. We appreciate your, uh, your comments and uh, thank you so much. Um, any others? At this time, I'm going to turn over the uh, meeting to Donnie for five, six, and seven. So agenda item five, Donnie. Thank you again, everybody. Yeah, this is an approval of our meeting agenda for today as expressed in the packet. And certainly with the open-endedness of some of the items that we need to address uh, without leading the committee to something that's not appropriate, I, I do feel like we need a motion to approve, but with a flexible agenda because there will be avenues for which we will go back and forth. At this point, do we have a motion to approve the agenda as being flexible? 
This is Ray Park, Northern 3A. I make a motion to approve a flexible agenda. Bill Darrow, second, Southern 2A. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Darrow. Any discussion to the agenda? All right, call for the question. All those in favor of the agenda approving as being flexible, please say aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Anybody opposed? All right, we have an agenda with which to work through today. Appreciate that very much. We will go to item number six then. And again, this is in your packet. I will direct you to pages four through seven in your packet. What, what I'm gonna tell you is we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time reviewing pages four through seven. And these are regulations that currently appear in our Nevada administrative codes through our handbook. However, as most of you know, that our board of control has granted some authority within this committee to present recommendations to the board that may be outside the specific scope of what's in our regulations. And that has gone through board action. Uh, I know Mr. Anderson, you are on here as well with regards to that, that um, with numbers of classifications and enrollment numbers, things that are really kind of specific into uh, NAC 385B.250, that this committee has made recommendations that might be a little bit different than what appears in, in that. And we know through working through legislative um, commission, uh, excuse me, legislative council bureau that we also know we're in uh, permission to do that. Would you like to make any comments to, to the structure of what this committee is gonna do in regards to NACs? I, I don't think any comments are necessary. I think you've covered it. Um, that's, that's what we've been doing and uh, it's been with uh, the blessing of the Legislative Council Bureau. Additionally, um, the Board of Control has submitted uh, a revised version of, of these regs to the Legislative Council Bureau, which is pending at that body right now. We haven't received it back. Um, once we get it back, then the Board of Control will review it and hopefully it'll be approved. That For those that are new, it's going to include uh, uh, the ability of this committee to realign based on a number of factors, um, including uh, use of a rubric. Um, you know, one of the problems we had in developing that reg or, or revising the regulation was uh, um, getting away from the stringent language that's in there now in terms of just numbers. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that that'll be back soon and then that'll give us absolute authority. But right now you have the authority to, to move in that direction anyway. Thank you, Mr. Paul Anderson, for your comments. I've got to note that we have two Mr. Andersons in here with, with Art Anderson representing uh, the 5A North. Bart Davis, thank you for that one. <laughs> appreciate you appreciate you catching me on that one. Uh, all right. With, with that said, again, I have no further comments or uh, items to address within uh, agenda item number six. Just just for, again, this is, this is not an action component at this point. Are there any questions from any of our realignment committee members, whether it be voting or non-voting? with regards to, again, the structure and the authority of this realignment committee. I'm gonna open up the floor at this time. Uh, Vice Chair Sloan, anything from you? Okay. No, I'm good. Okay. All right, seeing uh, no hands raised, no comments or uh, posts in chat, we will we'll move off of item number six then and we'll move to item number seven. Uh, item number seven is in essence, the roll call we just took, right? We, we've got a non-voting chair and a non-voting vice chair. They together will help coordinate uh, and lead this committee through this process. And they're gonna be greatly involved in uh, structuring meetings. We get into the three main topics with regards to the timeline, the policies and the procedures. We've then got a group of voting members. All of you know who you are and what you represent to just again for the public that may be on there. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing the screen there, uh, Bart, appreciate that. So we've, we've got three representatives from the 1A. The board in its last meeting approved an amendment to the voting membership in the 1A based on the number of schools that are within that classification. And uh, that was again a recommendation from our office and various league presidents to have three members of the 1A be represented because again, not because of the number of student athletes particularly represented within the schools uh, within the 1A, but based on the number of schools in the 1A. The 2A, uh, again, a balance of representation between North and South. The 3A, same thing, a balance of representation between North and South. 
and then to the 4A, 5A, kind of a similar structure to the to the 1A, in that Mr. Jackson also, like Ken, Ken Higby from the Central and the East representing the 1A, Mr. Jackson representing the 4A, 5A was also approved by the board to become a voting member and giving the 4A, 5A South as a collective 4A, 5A South three votes in this process, again, based on the representation of number of schools uh, that, that are uh, contained within the 4A, 5A South, and then uh, a 5A North voter as well. The non-voting consultants uh, representing the private schools and the charter schools, which, which fit uh, basically our structure of a board of control. And then we have our, our non-voting advisors and my sincerest apologies to Mr. Northridge, our staff coordinator for as our Southern coordinator for the NI office staff. He is not on there. That is completely my, my mistake. Uh, Bobby, my sincerest apologies on there. You are on there as a non-voting advisor as well, representing the staff. So there we have it. That is our review of our realignment committee's membership. Any any questions from any of our committee members at this point? Don, you have a comment, Bill Darrow from the 2A? Sure. Just, just to make everyone aware, um, I know this thing goes through the, you know, through 2023, and, and I am stepping away from athletics and retiring from athletics completely at the end of June of this year. So in February, we will choose somebody to take my place and finish my last year as liaison on the board, which would also, I'm sure, put them onto this committee to finish that for me too. So just to make you aware that I will, I will go through the June of this year. And then by then, by February, March, we'll have somebody else appointed and voted in for this position. You're a lucky man. 20 plus yeah, years you. on the board and, you know, enough. Thank, thank you, Mr. Darrow. I will, uh, I, I don't see uh, Mr. Stallworth back at his seat yet. I know he'll be put back in just a minute here. I, I know with Ms. Sloan on there as you know, Vice President of our Board of Control, I would believe then the structure this would be to make a replacement name-wise in that position is that the two-way South uh, bill through you and uh, through Jeff Newton, I believe as the league president, would then make the recommendation within the league, bring that forward to our office, and then I believe that we would vet it out of our office to our board of control, and we'd actually take action on a replacement name for uh, for that voting position. Does, does that yeah. sound correct? Uh, Wilson and Christian Calderon to the office. Oh, sorry, that was, that was um, Mr. Anderson, does that sound correct? Ms. Sloan, does that sound correct? And how we would, how we would actually bring that as an agenda item once we get to that summer meeting, the board of control, to put that name in there as a 2A South person? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's fine. Okay. Hey, Paul Anderson, this is Ray Parks. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. All right. So on those NACs, did you ever get it to where uh, these guys need to come through this realignment committee board before they go directly to the NIAA Board of Control so that we – I mean, it just seems like we're already back to where they skip the actual process. We spend all this time on realignment, yet they go directly to the board of control and it gets voted on. We talked about an NAC to change that. Are we working on that or did that ship sail? I, I'm not sure if I'm following you, Ray. What, what are you talking about? So like these guys, so we're going to do all this time on this NIAA realignment committee again, like I've done for 10 years. Right. And, uh, Yet at the next board agenda, I got a single A and a double A coming in to, to be realigned and they're going to be voted on before this committee's even done anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought our process basically was to follow the, the realignment. I Is that accurate, Donnie, or are we having? Well, I, yeah, I'm going to be, again, this is not an agenda item for this meeting. So I'm going to be, I'm going to make, just make the comment that through this process, right, we make recommendations to the Board of Control for ultimate approval. And however, within a Board of Control structure, that any principal can always place an agenda item on, on the on the for the board agenda. And so, you know, if we get that as as though it may look like a restructuring of a, of a realignment process or a league affiliation or a combining of things. Certainly, per our Nevada Administrative Codes, the principal has the authority to do that. And it doesn't mean that the Board of Control has to take any action to prove or deny that. So just so everybody on the committee is understanding that process. And um, Mr. Parks is aware of, of something coming up on our board agenda for our meeting next week. And it has to do with uh, small school soccer. 
And so that that's why his comment was from that. There, there's a little intertwining, right, between what this committee does and ultimate approval by the board of control, and then the ability of an agenda item still being placed by a principal, and that really can't be denied per per NAC. So I, that that's what Mr. Parks was asking for clarification on that. So so Paul, I think I've answered that question. For and, what's and, coming up next. And, and just to add in, remember, uh, Mr. Parks, when when they're on the agenda item, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a voting item by the committee or, or by the board. It's just a, a lot of it will be entitled informational only, uh, that kind of thing. And I, I, I want to say that that information would then come back to this realignment committee, and then we would go ahead and make a, a determination on the validity of, of, of whatever the proposal or suggestion or request was by the principal and or school. Generally, the, when, the principal, that, when the principal puts that on, Rollins, it's an action item. So my point is, you know, I'll quit talking, but we go to all this work and then they approve it. So why did I make all those schedules? Why do I redo all those schedules? Why do we redo them again if they don't like it? They go directly to the board. So I was hoping that we cleaned it up with an act so they had to come here first before they could just jump this committee and go to the board. So that's what I was getting at. And we can talk about that another day. Well, I think that that is done with the pending regulation. But as I said earlier, that, that regulation is is merely pending at the LCB at this point. So we don't have it um, back and approved yet, race. But that was okay. the idea that the realignment committee would make recommendations. And then the board of control ultimately uh, decides um, how matters go. I mean, they, they, they approve or uh, disapprove of, of action taken by this committee. So um, anyway, you, that's hopefully that answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. Ms. Sloan is our chair and vice chair. I think we've advanced through uh, number seven and let's go into number eight. So th this is where we all need to sit back, get comfortable. And as uh, Mr. Stallworth said earlier, feel free to make comments as we go through it. We have three main uh, subject matters to deal with here. The first one, I believe, is going to be the, well, hopefully, uh, the smoothest, and that, and that is the timeline. And in your packet, going to pages 10 through 12, that is the, the timeline. And this timeline that we've got, thank you, Mr. Davis, for putting that up there. This timeline is simply structured uh, very much like our last realignment committee. And it is a, as we advance through the process, I would describe it as a season by season approval. Uh, and that includes about using rubrics. Uh, again, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, putting schools and teams into leagues and classifications. Uh, this, this process spreads it out and gives the committee time to work uh, on, on a season by season basis with those sports. And I mean, to review real quick here where we're starting, right? We, we are on November 30th, 2021. We're, we're meeting the, the first criteria there. And the first one, again, not a date specifically put on there. That's where we started when we had our workshop that this would happen in this process. So here's where we are today. And those are reviewing the amount that administrative codes done, the 2022-23 timeline process. That's reflected in what you see here for possible recommendation to the board as, as an adoption to this committee moving forward and data from past, current, and future projections. Uh, that is something that we will verbally go over. It's not a, a bunch of data in your packet. And part of the reason is because we've been on delay for a year and a half with, with COVID. So that is almost something that we will hold uh, for another meeting to take out of there. So we can, we can leave in there, we can scratch that out once we get to a point of approval. Um, goals and objectives, again, that is almost something that we can open up as we get through this process on an individual basis for your comments, like we did in our workshop, and then other issues deemed to be relevant. Then we advance into the, the spring 22 meeting. Uh, again, we'll have a hearing with our membership on the recommendations uh, if we do get to a full adoption here on the timeline uh, policies and procedures of this group. And then we will ultimately move that into the board of control in our spring meeting for a uh, board, board approval of that. We go into the summer and fall, we start looking at um, 
what you see there. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for scrolling that up. I'm gonna look the screen like everybody else here. We got a lot of things to talk about. We start taking some real action, uh, looking ahead, and then we get into the fall of 2022 in the realignment committee meeting. We'll be back again. So as you three through your packet there, I'm not gonna go through these one by one here. Uh, again, you, you can all do what you do, but there is a spread out process in, in timeline for this. At this point, if you haven't already, I'd like to just kind of give everybody a minute to scroll through your packets. Again, pages uh, 10 through uh, 12. Look at that, and we can we can address any particular item or meeting that's that's dated uh, accordingly with what's in there. Uh, we can also uh, go through questions and comments that you might have with that. So let, let's take let's take one minute, everybody. Again, if you haven't already done so, scan it, go through it, and then we'll go into a, a one by one issue with this timeline for uh, ultimate adoption if we get to that point. So take take it just a minute. All right, and then I'll come back and just for questions in one second. And just a comment for those of you that might be at home or listening via YouTube or other device that, again, this information is on our website at niaa.com. So if you're not able to see the screen that we're showing to, uh, to the public and to the packet that our realignment committee members have in front of them that they're reviewing, you're able to view that accordingly. Donnie? Yes, Mr. Jackson. Question for you, uh, last realignment, the effort was made to have a coordinated um, advancement of the schools coming in from associate membership to full membership to match up with their dates of alignment. With the change in the alignments going from even numbers to odd numbers because of uh, our pandemic, is that going to be adjusted accordingly? Well, that, that is a great question, Mr. Jackson. Um, the answer would be yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I would address that. Let me let me uh, bring back in our board president and, and vice president, uh, again, as our realignment committee chair and vice chair, Mr. Stallworth, Ms. Sloan. Comments to you on that, because it, that may be something that in our next, in our spring board of control meeting, we might have to include that within this process. Uh, does, that, does that make sense to you, Mr. Stallworth? Comments to you first, and I'll go to Ms. Sloan. Uh, yes, it does. And, and I think it's been it's been long overdue that we kind of match these up because they've, it's been kind of inconsistent and created some problems as far as um, schools applying for membership and all of that. So I think it would uh, hopefully provide some fluidity in the in this process and, and a time frame in which schools can operate and 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 work on the process of being a full member at a at an opportune. To, uh, the opportunity presents itself and, and, and makes that process better. Ms. Sloan, your thoughts, if you have any? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, right now I'm looking at the NIAA Board of Control agenda for the meeting we're having in a couple of weeks. And I see that there's three schools right now that are looking to come uh, to be a full member second year of the realignment. And I know going forward, and I want to make sure that this is clear and we have the, the correct process in place, is that if somebody wants to become a full member year two, that's not going to happen going forward. This is a big strain because I do believe that the three schools that are looking to come to become full members will be play are currently should be placed in a 3A, which will now exceed the numbers. And we also have to have a process and probably talk about that within this group. What do we do? Because we're capped out now, what do we do with the three existing schools in the 3A that now will need to go to the 4A? Or are we going to just say it is what it is? We're, gonna, we're going to allow them to all be in the 3A? So that needs to be also part of the process. So, but yeah, we definitely need to lock things in. And I'm gonna go back to what Ray Park said earlier too. I totally agree with Ray Parks because what has happened is that this committee puts hours, tons of hours in making decisions, tough decisions. And then all of a sudden we have had schools go to the board of control, schedules are out. Um, all of these days on to put hours and putting schedules together. And then all of a sudden 
individuals come to the board, they appeal, the board approves, and everyone has to go back to, to the first peg and start again. That's not fair to the leagues. So, oh, and I, yeah. I, yeah, and I thought we got rid of that last year. I thought with the realignment process last time, if a school wanted to appeal their alignment, they had to come to the realignment committee to voice that appeal. And if you remember correctly, that worked significantly. And, and, and actually we only dealt with a few appeals at that time. And then I believe we made our presentation to the board. We did, but at the same time, if you recall, absolutely, you're absolutely correct. But at the same time, part of the process, I believe, and Paul, you can, Don, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that schools still have the opportunity to come to the board of control because the board of control has the final vote for right, the recommendations there, by the realignment. That, that's what the last committee approved and that's how it went and you're right, but you're both right, Rollins. They, they, they would come to the committee for their initial appeal and the committee would make a decision and take that to the board of control and then the, the, the school would still have the opportunity to present an argument to the board of control. Okay, and if I'm correct then, when that did happen last year, I don't think that the board or the committee lost any of those decisions that were made by the board, uh, by the committee, by the by the board's vote. Am I correct, or Tim? Was there one that was changed? No, I, I'm not. I'm not worried, Rollins. I really am not worried about that vote, though. Those votes were all done. I think there was a couple adjustments that were made. Some people stayed in the five A. Some people stayed in the four A. Whatever, or went from five A to four A. My concern is we we were on an even year number. And the three schools that are coming in with membership were coming in on an even year. Mm -hmm. But because we took last year as a wash with realignment, we now have taken realignment and put it on the odd years. But we have these three schools coming in on an even year yeah. that we'll have to adjust for. I want to make sure that the schools coming forward will now know, listen, you may come in, but you will not come in until the, the alignment is, is the same. So mm -hmm. there may be an overlay of some associate members and i'm trying to think if there's anybody on, off the top of my head i'm thinking of right now have permission to play that might extend their associate membership maybe another year and i don't know if that's going to be an issue hey tim this is bob nor the yeah we've got one maybe two schools that'll fit into that and then and i've had some correspondence and it's it's um kind of too bad because it's extended since they started their process the right time from a three-year process really going to go to a four-year process. And they said, well, you told us it was going to be a three-year deal. Now all of a sudden you're extending it. Well, you know, it's it, it, uh, the pandemic's thrown everybody off their game, but uh, they were just wondering if there was a way around that. And that's my concern because we have, we are now in, this is the fourth cycle of two years, if I'm correct, or fourth cycle of two years where each year we've had to change our leagues because somebody has has come in and we're gonna have to do it again with the two additions to uh, the 3A that are coming in next year off of off based off the agenda. So I wanna make sure we share that with everyone and make sure that the committee understands that we may be looking at a, at a couple of schools who are not gonna like what, what's gonna happen. No. And I, I don't know, I'm not making any decision on that. I'm just saying that it's out there and I don't know if the timelines adjust for that. And I agree 100% that they should come in on realignment years since we're going every two years. It's just that they think they're getting held out to dry a little bit here that, um, you know, that we told them three and now we're extending it to four. And, you know, once again, you can kind of see their point. Correct, Tim? Hey, Tim, I got something. Mr. Parks. Paul, maybe you can help too. So we'd also talk about you know, because it's just, I think it's killing the South and it's a nightmare for you guys to make schedules allowing this. We talked about, you know, looking at, they had to have 70% of the sports offered or something like that. Did we ever move forward with that? Because this stuff where they come in, they just have, you know, a boy and girl cross country and then they want to build a basketball team and a boy and girl track. That's not fair to the 3A down there. And then the 3A numbers look big and I got my 12 here and yet, you guys say you got 12 in the 3A South, but you really don't because three or four of those schools don't offer any of the sports. What happened to that? Now, Ray, that, you're 100% correct there, and we got one school that abuses that thing really bad, too. 
Okay. Let me get on well, what's the consequence for that? You know, that's kind of our question. We've discussed it. Is there a consequence for them saying that they're going to have certain sports and then don't? Um, the other thing I just wanted to interject on that, I, I know on, on page 21 of the packet, it talks about our heart, or the cap, the 8 to 12. But we also understand that we may get extra schools in there that will take us above that 12 that are those enrollment schools. Uh, I mean, that's an understanding we've got, and we've discussed in, in our Southern meetings anyway with 3A. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Wilson. We will address numbers when we get into that area. And do we fix numbers? Do we give a wider, broader range? Uh, how do we handle that? You're, you're going to have to make some decisions on that uh, as we get through this, uh, this, this first initial type of meeting. And back to regards to our, our new members coming in uh, on, a, on a full basis, you know, the, the Board of Control will be the ultimate group that will admit these members and they will set, have the authority to set the, the entry date for full postseason eligibility. And so the board, even though we're, we're in an odd uh, rollover cycle, the board can say you're, you're effective at, you know, the fall of 23 or that, that determined date. So there is, there is authority within the board. Tony. Good question to comments. Yes, Mr. Darrell. Bill Darrell, two way south. You know, as what we were talking about a second ago about admitting schools that, that have tennis and then they just have basketball, the major sport, and then they have, you know, some small thing in the, in the South. I've said this before, and I know it has to go to the board, but, but the only way to fix that, to stop this from happening, is to change that regulation to say you have to have a, a boys and girls sport in every season that does not include an individual state championship. That would solve the problem for full membership. That would solve like the it. scheduling problems. That would, that would solve all the problems, except for the ones who want to come in and do that. So I've said it before. If you think about it, if you have to have a boys and girls sport in every season that doesn't involve an individual championship, state championship, it takes care of that problem. But that would have to be a regulation change. Yeah, let's um, yeah, let's, let's let's stay on topic with the timeline. I appreciate those comments because that is something again that would require a proposal to amend, um, well, NACs and any other kind of realignment process we have. So. All right, sorry. Yeah, th those might be questions that you'd start within your league meetings and to see if there's some flavor of that. And at some point, that could ultimately advance to a proposal, you know, to our board of control. But th that's how it starts. We'd, ha we'd have to have something written out and defined and revised. So, um, but that, that may be a topic for your league meetings right there. Maybe a topic for the athletic directors conference. I don't really know. That's a good, but you're going to make comments well received. Thank you. Uh, back to the timeline then with, with everybody an opportunity to, to review it. Is there something that, uh, you, and I'm going to go person by person here on our in terms of our voting members and into our non voting consultants? Uh, anything that you see that may be off, different, needs to be amended specifically within a particular time frame? Let me go and start with, with Mr. Higby. Uh, Dr. Higby, any, anything in particular you see on pages 10 through 12 that needs an amendment? Not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vick, anything that you see? Uh, Mr. Strong, anything that you no, see? I think, we're, I think we're good. Thank you, Donnie. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Maybe a, maybe a mute there. Okay. Uh, Mr. Darrell? Looks fine. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Looks good. Mr. Wilson? Oh, yeah, we're good. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Gearson? Nothing at this time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, McPartland? Sorry, oh, okay. Looks good to me. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Jackson? Looks good. Okay. Mr. Anderson? Nothing at this time. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Walter? That uh, looks good to me, too. Okay. Mr. Kofer? All right. With that said, then, again, in knowing, knowing that in our very first one that we understand, depending on how far we get or don't get through today, that we may have to meet uh, in the springtime prior to our Board of Control meeting, uh, I don't believe that that needs any other, uh, because there is an adoption to uh, the, the final adoption may be done later. You see that in the third bullet point there under our first session here for November, December, 2021. So uh, Mr. Stallworth, I'm going to turn it back to you then. And for item number eight, I, I believe if there's not any other comment, we can at least get a motion to approve the timeline as presented on pages 10 through 12. And we'll go from there. Hey, this is Ray Parks. I'd like to make a motion to approve the timeline. Ada Wilson, second. All right, Mr. Parks, motion, Mr. Wilson, second. 
do we have any uh, additional questions or comments at this time? Well, I, I, I just uh, have additional comment. And I think that, um, again, there needs to be uh, an agenda item in the future by the board to, uh, to meet to revise that membership application and, uh, and get that done and get that established and set up. I think uh, I know that I was a member and several of us that are uh, on this on this Zoom right now, we're on the uh, application uh, committee, membership application committee in the past. And I think that COVID and the pandemic and all that kind of put a stop to all of that earlier. So um, it, it looks like I think we're gonna have to reestablish that and, and get that done and get that done as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stoll. Uh, Ms. Lotz, if you're, uh, I know you're in the background there, if you're able to, um, comment on that with regards to the membership application process. You work with that on a day in day out basis. I believe we're already leading in that direction, correct? Yes and no, but it depends on which membership status um, the committee here is talking about. So we have members that the th we have three members that are applying for new membership, which means they would be an associate member and all of their sports would be independent status. So they wouldn't be placed into a league and they'd still have to create their own schedules. Whereas we have schools that have been associate members for a minimum of two years that are also applying for full membership. And I think those are more the ones you're looking at um, that the full membership come in on the even or odd years um, in alignment with the realignment. So I think there's two different things being discussed. And um, so I just want to make that clear. Yeah. Th thank you, Lori. I appreciate your comments. And that's something, again, that I think then at uh, with, with our president of our board, Rollins, vice president of our board, Pam, uh, we can then work through some, some of those comments. And I'll, anyway, we'll, we'll advance to that. I don't want to stall, stall number eight any further than that and get off, get off track here. So that's it. Any, any other questions or comments with regards to uh, the motion on the table? All right, call for the question. All those in favor, please. Hey, Manette. Hey, going to travel. Aye. 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 Thank you, buddy. Anybody opposed? All right. Appreciate your time. We will move on from number eight with our timeline passing at 9.50 a.m. That. All right. And again, today, as, as you know, we're the plan is to go until noon. Uh, we may not go that long if we get too long into the noon hour, we're, we're kind of stuck on some things. Again, that doesn't mean we couldn't come back again into the uh, springtime and go forth. So with that said, let's go to where we're going to really start having my favorite word, some fun. Let's move into, let's move into policies, beginning on page 13 in your packet. Uh, you know, I, I'm blessed that we have a wonderful office staff uh, with which I get to work on a day in, day out basis. The addition of, sorry, sorry, Bart Davis, I don't mean to give you kudos in front of everybody, but I do. Uh, You've been a vested person in this whole process with realignment and what you do and rubric scores and seeing the data in many different factors. And you've really been able to see this on, on a grand basis here in our office staff this year, but really dating back for a few years. So as we get into the policies, there are going to be many times that Mr. Davis is going to help lead on our behalf of our committee discussion in this area as we look to get into some, some motions and what have you. Um, I'm Mr. Davis, without jumping too far ahead here, I'm going to go to on page 13, number two, the classification. And the reason I'm going to start there is because what we just passed in the, the timeline obviously is reflective of the current that we have classes 1A through 5A. With that said, in number two, we're going to start right there. And are we still going to continue to have five classifications? Do we is there any interest to reduce to four classifications back to where we were not that many years ago? Is there interest to go to six classifications and how that would be structured? Uh, I'm, I'm going to start right there. And Mr. Stallworth, I'm going to have you lead discussion on that because once we get past this item, as we go page by page, I know Mr. Davis has a list of, of topics really to discuss with the, with the committee and leading us through, through this particular item, especially as we get to page uh, 15 and move through some real detailed information. So, that's it, Mr. Stallworth. Any, any questions that I'll let you lead discussion on the number of classifications? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, you know, you know. First of all, I, I'd like to say that the the work that the committee has done 
has been outstanding. And, and, and I could go on and on about the positives of the, the one through five A classifications. Uh, but I do think that there are there have been some issues that have been raised that are continuing to come up and we still need to get more documentation and more da data uh, with regards to participation. But um, to me, it seems like some of the placement of some of our individual sports, uh, for example, uh, our move to move uh, the North Valley's um, hug and Wooster soccer programs to the 5A was a was a phenomenal move for, for, for them. Uh, to participate and play, and that's kind of showed uh, through the process of uh, the success that they've had on the field. Um, I, I think that the placement of some of the current Northern 5A schools that are currently playing 3A level sports, and specifically, we can talk about those soccer programs that uh, one of them had some success, the other two uh, were, were fairly uh, at least competitive in, in the 3A. And, and it worked out uh, fairly well. So those are some of the positives that have taken place here. Um, but I do think that, that that there has been some issues that we've had. I know I've been talking to Ray Parks about the 3A, and we've had some we have some issues in the 3A North that uh, that that need to be addressed and and need to be ironed out as we move forward. Um, if not next year, the, definitely during the realignment. Uh, and the ugly head of uh, the 5A has reared itself uh, again in the north with, with talk now about uh, wanting to go possibly down to the 4A or, or, or some split between 4A and 5A programs. So that's kind of where we're at in the north right now. And I think we need to talk, talk about this and open this up for discussion. And I know that I've spent a little bit of time talking to uh, Ray Parks about this and uh, spent a little bit of time talking to uh, Bart um, about this down uh, from his perspective as, as the, the leader of, of, of this department with regards to the data and the, and the, uh, the, uh, the classification identification of schools. Bart, you wanna come in and, and bounce off of that a little bit or Ray? Um, Mr. Parks, if you'd like to go first, please go ahead and then I'll follow up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Davis. We're going to have Mr. Parks go first, and then we're going to have Mr. Art Anderson go with reflection because we're really, we're, we're talking about Northern 3A, possible 4A, 5A. So, Mr. Parks, why don't you go ahead and leave us off, please? Sure. So, we've had lots of discussions, and, and you know, Rollins and I have been around forever. So, in theory, it went, it was going to go great, and in practice, it just, it doesn't. And, uh, the 5A guys coming to us for soccer absolutely does not work and it can't continue anymore because financially it's impossible. So, you know, I got to deal with a lot of different superintendents, different leagues, different counties, and they just, they're not doing it. So with that said though, I love the fact that Sparks plays up. I love that Hug does. I love that North Valley does. That's what this was intended. That doesn't mean that we have to move schools down. You know, just because it works in Las Vegas doesn't mean it works in, in Northern Nevada. And I'm cool with how they do it in Vegas. I think it works great for them. But again, I've taught, had these discussions, Spring Creek High School in Elko County, all the way to South Tahoe High Schools, like 350 miles. You can't do a makeup. It's impossible. So when these things all happen and and we had COVID issues or we had transportation issues and those are all real. Transportation issues have become very real in, in all these small towns. It just, it's a, it just does not happen. So uh, I don't wanna, you know, I'm not gonna, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, knowing it's wrong. There's no reason to do that again next year. Those 5A guys want out, we want them out, but we want our 3A schools up there, the, the very competitive ones. Um, the only one that does not want to come down is the McQueen boys soccer coach because they won. And I get that. But we got to start looking globally. We got to look long term. We got to look at what works for everybody. You know, uh, Elko County School District has two, two high schools in the 3A. You know, they, they want to get grumpy with me and say, all right, then we, we'll go Elko up to the 5A. And then all you guys from Washoe can drive all the way out there all the time. And I know nobody wants to do that. We don't want to do that either. 
But I'm frankly, I'm tired of the 3A fixing everybody's problems. Mr. Art Anderson, I'll turn to you, please. What uh, what is the 5A feel at this point? And looking at a 4A, or again, uh, the ideas of rubric being used and bouncing to not not bouncing, but um, putting into 5A and 3A. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, and and again, Doug, thank you. Um, I I understand what Ray's saying. I, I I agree with a lot of what Ray's saying. 5A North. Um, I, I believe, and it, and it usually comes after every state championship, that they really struggle with the idea that they are going to be competing against probably in the, in the men's sports, one team in particular, every time, and, and they're going to lose every time. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I'm not willing to listen to a lot of suggestions. I don't have the answer myself. But... Um, I, I know why the 5A was created, uh, but I don't know if that's going to make anything more competitive in a state championship, especially in the men's sports, the major men's sports, football, basketball, baseball, um, with the North. I mean, I, 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 I don't. Hey, hey, Rollins. Talk to me. So, you know, you and I are commiserated for years, hugging Lowry and and when we were in the big league, and, and you obviously got it together. But why can't Northern Nevada be in the 4A and actually play for state championships and let the 5A South be the 5A South? Uh, that is the sentiment and the, the, the attitude that is being spread around now up here. Um, I can tell you that. There's a higher percentage of, of schools and coaches that are wanting to be more of a 4A program than a 5A program. Not really, you know, and I don't want to talk about just the, the situation with Gorman because that, you know, that situation is what it is. And, 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 and I respect them and they do what they need to do. And it is phenomenal. But take, I don't even want to mention them. I just want to mention the numbers. If you look at the, current 5A schools in the North from a population standpoint, from and I mean student population, from a student population standpoint and from a competitive standpoint, they are, majority of those schools are 4A level schools in the state of Nevada. They are not 5A level schools. They may have a sport or two that might be five level, uh, 5A level, but the majority of them are 4A uh, level and competing schools. Uh, so with that said, uh, if there is a movement for those 4A schools, the, the current 5A schools in the North to be and have the majority of their programs in the 4A um, and have those and, and the few of those schools uh, or, or, or sports in the 5A in certain sports, I think that would be the option that uh, the North is kind of looking at right now. And if that would happen, I think it would solve a little bit of Ray's problem with, with regards to some of the current four, uh, 3A schools that are specifically in Washoe County might go back to and participate in the, in the 4A. And I think that's what I, I was hoping that Ray, when Ray sent something out about some of the schools moving to the 4A, that's what he was referring to if the 5A schools would move down in, in, in capacity to play in the 4A up north. So that I, I just want yeah. people to keep that in mind because I'm doing surveys right now from our school standpoint. And I think the animal in this room is gonna be the financial one and the transportation one, because those two go hand in hand. And so far we just finished the, the, the the fall sports and and my budget has already been 50% taken away already just with the fall sports championships because we had 5A and 3A championships in the south that that almost doubled in size of what we would normally if this was a southern year we wouldn't have spent anything or excuse me if this was a northern year we wouldn't have spent a penny on travel and and this year we spent almost half of our budget already just for the fall sports with 
uh, schools um, in our district making the 5A, 3A, and 2A state championships. So um, it impacted us tremendously. And I know that our, our school board and, and, and my administration is going to go completely ballistic when they get these bills that are coming in um, that are taking place. And mind you, that was a bill that's going in that does not include all the games that Ray mentioned in our district that weren't played east in eastern Nevada because schools didn't go. Yeah. That's so, why I think you got to start calling it the GoFundMe School District. Instead of watch it. <laughs> Mr. Stallworth, I'm going to uh, direct it back to Art Anderson for comment. I'm going to have Mr. Bart, uh, Mr. Davis from our staff jump in. I know he's got some ideas in the way as we look at a structure with the, the northern block of schools between 3A and 5A. And then after uh, Mr. Davis, I want to hear from our 4A, 5A Southern representatives about the possibility of you know what we may be hearing here is a, a 5A North being a 4A North, and that would leave a 5A as as a Southern based only rather than the 4A Southern based. And in terms of number of teams that would be required to, I mean, you know, have, have a championship in the 5A. Anyway, there's there's a lot of thoughts going on real quick. So, well, Mr. Anderson, you first. Well, yeah. just to take along with what Donnie just said there, um, and this really does go to the 5A South, is and it might be too early in the realignment right now to even know that information. But if the 5A North eventually votes to go to the 4A, um, especially in all the major sports, it, does that dissolve the 5A completely? Does the South 5A stay, or do we just start over and get rid of a 5A? Great question. Mr. Davis, I know you might have some comments about the North structure in a 4A. Is all for none, or sport by sport, or any options? I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to turn the clock back a few years here on this group real quick and just remind everybody that when we set the 5A classification up and started doing the rubric points to determine where those larger schools would go, 4A or 5A, it was south only, right? This rubric was not intended for the north. That got brought into the equation when I believe it was Truckee and South Tahoe came before the committee and came before the board and said they had real problems with transportation. And they weren't going to be able to get buses to fulfill their 3A schedule going across the state. It was at that time that we started building a rubric in to balance that a little bit more to give Truckee and South Tahoe teams closer to them that they could play in a league. And that's where we developed that West and East League in 3A. Those leagues decided to cross over and play crossover games as part of the league schedule. Perfectly fine. They have the right to do that. That's not something they have to do. And that may be a possibility as well where that 3A stay self-contained in a West and an East, they don't cross over. They can cross over for non-league if they want to, to help fill out their schedule, but then just go straight to the playoffs and have a bracketed three and three for six teams, however they want to do it. I know there was talk in that as well, that the way they have it set up and we had to, we had to change midstream on this because of the, the issues with wildfires and transportation and whatever else that the 3A wanted to do champions of each league and next best four teams because maybe the best four or five teams in the 3A North were in one league or the other. We haven't seen how that's going to pan out yet. We, we, we don't know, but based on who's gotten to uh, championship games, that doesn't really seem to be the case across the board. Now, all that being said, Mr. Anderson's comment about would it dissolve the 5A? Not necessarily. And I think really the South and I don't want to speak for the Southern members on this committee at all, but I think from talking to different schools in the South, this really has worked for them to this point. It's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. But it has allowed schools that haven't won, haven't been competitive, to be competitive. Not about winning a state title. That's not what this process is about at all. It's about putting teams in positions where they can be more competitive so that we can start to grow programs. What I've talked about with some people from the North regarding a 4A or 5A in the North, we have schools in the South that are 4A in some sports, 5A in other sports. We don't have the numbers of schools in the North that we have in the South. We can't necessarily split into three classifications among the 21 schools that are 3A or 5A in the North right now. You could maybe do it in some sports, it might not work in others. 
but there's no reason why based on what we used to qualify teams right now, that the Northern largest classification, whatever you want to call it, couldn't be 5A in cross country and compete for cross country titles the way they did this year, that they could be 5A in soccer and advance a team to the state championship the way Hug did this year, that they could be 5A in baseball and softball where they can be competitive, might not win every year, but softball certainly had a real good run in the North but they could be 4A in other sports. But I think that decision needs to be made not team by team, but probably sport by sport in the North, just given the number of of teams there are in the North compared to the South. I'm not sure if everybody can follow that full discussion as I'm just throwing it at you. But I think those are possibilities we can look at. I'm not dead set on saying we have to put a team one place or another. I'm not dead set on saying you have to use this data. Again, never intended for the North. The North asked into it as a result of South Tahoe and Truckee having real transportation issues, not just cost-wise, but even getting buses to travel to some of the 3A games across the state. I don't know that that's changed. That's something South Tahoe and, and, and Truckee would have to answer. And we certainly get the geography is very, very different in the South than it is in the North. But if we went back to where we were four years ago, South Tahoe and Truckee still have those same problems, likely, trying to go to a Spring Creek or an Elko. So there's a lot in that discussion in that should we have five classifications really goes tying into and and almost cyclical with what is the North going to do here? Because if you've got an Elko or a Spring Creek that want to go up, if that 3A is restricted, well, then Washoe's got a travel issue, and Mr. Stallworth already mentioned some of the, the costs and the transportation issues that they have. There's a lot of factors in play here. Ideally, what we'd like to do is what's going to give the student athletes the best opportunity to compete. And again, defining compete, not winning state championships and everything, but on a daily basis, having a legitimate shot to go out there and, and at least be in the game. Right. You can be competitive and still be 0 and 18 if you lost every game by one. You can be non competitive and, and be 2 and 16 because you beat one other team but got drilled by everybody else. We have to keep in mind what's competitive here. And again, we have to work within the systems of transportation and budgets. That's just a, a, a fact of life anymore. It's unfortunate that we have to, but we do have to. But I think we can look at several different options here where we don't have to just wad things up and throw them away because they haven't worked for the first few months. I'm not saying you have to keep going with those, but maybe we don't necessarily throw out all the bathwater here and and look at what's what's going to be best for the most number of student athletes. Scheduling is going to be hard. Mr. Jackson, I feel for you. Mr. Parks, I feel for you and what you have to do. We've all done things like that, maybe not to the magnitude you're doing it. We got to keep in mind that it's about the student athletes here and what we do. And again, we're open to any option here. I've got things that I think might work, but maybe they don't work for certain areas of the state or certain schools. And we don't want to force that on you, much the same way we didn't force the rubric on on the North to begin with. So uh, off the rails here a little bit, but we need to decide first, do we want to go with five classifications? And if so, what does that North look like? I, before we even get into any other part of the policies, that I think is something we have to decide. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Stallworth, sorry I've taken up so much of the time, but. No problem. I just, I would like to piggyback off of that a little bit. Um, I am in the process right now of surveying the fall coaches that just finished uh, coaching in Washoe County and uh, their athletic departments. And basically my question will be simple. Do you want to continue in the next realignment cycle? Do you want to continue playing in the 5A at, in your particular sport? Yes or no, it's just that simple. Um, and I will take that number and then I will do the same for the winter sports and I'm gonna do the same for the uh, spring sports. So I will have that data as we go. Um, and bring that data back to uh, the committee um, and, and, go, and go from there. I really think that that information is gonna be vital with regards to any school saying, 
we want to be able to play in the 5A in this sport. So we would at least have an identity and, and, and some numbers of schools that would be willing to uh, play in that, for example, that upper, upper level. My guess would be that at this particular time, if you're going to play 4A, you need to play. If you want to go down to the 4A, you need to play 4A and play 4A in every dang sport. And if there is a single sport that has an, uh, an abundant number of schools that say we want to play 5A in soccer, then we would bring that to the table and bring that to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Stallworth. I want to um, turn over to Mr. Gearson, then Mr. McPartland, then Mr. Jackson. Let's, let's go in that order as the three of you are hearing some of this and the possibility of a 5A being South only or the North being 4A or some combination thereof of 3A, 4A, and 5A. Obviously, we're, we're uh, ultimately, we're going to get to a point where today we're just going to adopt five classifications and not specify where Northern schools are going to go. Uh, but just with that said, I'm just a little bit open-ended. So, um, uh, Ron, Ron, you first. We certainly enjoy competing with the schools up north. We do. But we also appreciate um, the balance that we need between competitive balance and travel uh, as it's related to funding and time constraints. And so uh, I would fully support what uh, our northern schools uh, feel is best for their schools, their programs, and, and for their students. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. McPartland. So, um, you know, I think definitely just to go back to the, the, the 4A, 5A in the South, it, and I, I, people have said it before, it works down here. I think, you know, just the Silverado, Shadow Ridge football, I mean, that just shows it, it is working here. Um, as far as competitive balance, I mean, I think what we see down here is in every sport, not just the men's. I mean, you throw girls basketball in there. There's two or three teams that they're, they're a couple tiers above the rest of us. And so there's that lack of competitive balance, except for those top few teams anyway. Um, so competitive balance, I certainly would love to keep Northern schools with us. So we have a true state championship at the highest level. Um, speaking of costs and time and transportation. Yeah. I don't think that I, I can't speak to that, but certainly having half a budget being taken for um, for transportation is a concern. So I think the appetite for some the five A schools that um, that I'm confident speaking for is to maintain some type of true state championship as much as possible, so that we don't just have ten schools in Southern Nevada competing. Um, for, for the highest championship we could have. So that's kind of where we're at, but I do understand uh, the cost and the travel and the time being an issue. All right, thank you, sir. And Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jackson, before you go, Mr. Stallworth, I will be right back. Um, I need to hop to something, emergency situation, I'll, but I'll be right back. I'll let you continue to direct uh, you and Mr. Davis back through, uh, continue on the pages 13 and 14, see if we get to just a classification area. Again, first, and then we'll get into the, the rubric process after that. So I, I shouldn't be very long, but Mr. Jackson, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, sir. I just want to let everybody know I'll be right back. Go ahead. Hey, sir. Thank you, Thanks, Donnie. Donnie. Hey, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to everybody in here with the gray hair that's been on this for all these years um, and go back to when we started this way back years ago in room 402 at Durango when uh, the very first idea of a rubric was presented uh, by Mr. Wilson and Mr. Petrie years and years ago. And the reason for it was the 3A down south had three teams left. We had Virgin Valley, Moapa Valley, and Boulder City. And we needed to, we needed to help them. So we started looking at this. Um, at the end of it, what we've ended up with after all these years, and I want to say we're getting close to what, 14, 16 years of, of this rubric process across the board going from development to today, is that in the end, the South used the rubric for competitive balance and for the saving of the 3A. We needed to help the 3A and save that. We needed that balance down here because we had three teams left. And it was rough. It was very, very rough down here the first few years. Egos were bruised. Egos were hurt because I'm an upper, I'm a lower, I'm an upper, I'm a lower. It was all over the place. And we've gone through that whole entire process. I, I think when the North first looked at the rubric, I do believe that transportation and availability of teams to play within their realm for the 3A and what is now the 5A 
was the driving force. And I, I, I think that those two things are divergent. We, we, we came from, we started in different places and went different directions. And what we've ended up with, I believe, is after all these years and all these bumps, we've ended up with a 5A, 4A, and a 3A down here that is, it, it's truly some very competitive balance. Uh, if you look at the teams that made it past the regionals into the state qualifying tournament from the 3A, uh, Bart, correct me if I'm wrong, but almost to the number, they were 3A enrollment schools, if, they, if not all. A lot of them were. Yeah, correct. And it was very competitive. I mean, it was great what we needed to see down here. The 4A, we, we had teams that were competitive back and forth. That The 4A, I think, was uh, highly successful. And then the 5A was 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 beautiful. It, 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 like Bart said, we, he, he always said he would spike the ball when he finally saw one happen. And, and I think he can spike the ball. I think we've got a system that really works. When you're looking at the North, I don't think the numbers would support going with sport by sport like we did down here I, I don't know if we have enough numbers up there um what i don't want to see happen is this and, and i know that the south would agree with this if i said this would be that what if only one or two schools want to play football in the 5a rollins are you going to be able to ship them down every time no it, it, it just it's cost prohibitive so what i see happening with ray in the 3a over where he's at is the numbers there aren't there. So he's got to travel all this distance to play and that's impacting his budget. I see the 5A up in the North saying, well, we really should have been in the 4A, but we voted to go into the 5A during the realignment cycle last time. We said, hey, let's, we're 5A, we're gonna go up here. And we ended up with that situation. So I think the dynamics between the two different ends of the state are completely different arguments. Ray, your argument about transportation and competition is completely different than what we deal with down here in the 3A, where we have a plethora of teams to play in the 3A. Some of them are enrollment 4A schools, but they're not competitive. So Jay Dell is playing, and he might be playing a Western who's rebuilding a program in girls basketball, but he's not playing a Western in soccer that's a 5A. So we have teams that go the whole gamut because of the sheer numbers. Uh, I can tell you that this year, without doubt, while there are still critics out there, a few of them were on social media complaining until the state championships when they all looked at it. I would say this is one of the most successful realignments we've ever had in the South across the board. It Dude, was I, an amazing. Tim, I'm awesome. cool with that. I, I think it's great down there that it does that. But, but Roland, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. So I've I physically go and see all of our guys, or I call them on the phone in addition to emails and so on. So if I if we did it tomorrow, all 12 of those schools, unless Rollins correct me, want to remain in the 3A. Elko never wants to move up. Spring Creek never wants to move up. Burnley doesn't want to move up. We have a great 3A league, and we have two divisions now, and I hate it when we call it the East League and the West League. Because it's not. We are a 12-member Northern Nevada 3A league. We split into two divisions to try and help travel. So when we say that, um, then I have a hard time sometimes getting to South Tahoe or someone to, to want to come out because they don't want to do a crossover. Well, that's not what it is. We are a 3A league. We have two divisions, and we're working hard to, to save some money and do some travel, and I think we're doing the right thing. But – Unless these guys, and these are either the principal, the vice principal, or the AD, every one of them wants to remain in the Northern 3A because we like what we're doing. I feel for the, the 5A guys here. Maybe some of them want to come into the 3A. Maybe we can talk about that kind of stuff. But we like our 12-member league, and we don't want to change what you guys are doing in the South that works because when it comes time to it, it's great state championships, 3A and 3A down there. Now, now Rollins stuff with the Northern 4-5A, eh? I get that. That's got to be a tough way to go. Well, just to piggyback on Tim, I, I agree with you 100% that, uh, you know, with, with, a, with a district that big, a district that diverse, and a district that has so many changes in schools, um, you know, it, it works and it works perfectly for you. What we have to do is find out what works for us up here. And, and that's going to be the biggest challenge. Now, I want to go back to the previous realignment. 
it was always the feeling that the 5A North had was is that the NIAA and, and, and the pressure from to have a state championship in the 5A was placed on our league and that when it was first came out, I don't think we necessarily had the option. It was just like, you guys are gonna be in the 5A. And then we had to kind of work our way kind of out of it. And that's kind of how a lot of the coaches and the athletic directors kind of felt about it because of the state championships. And, and we've always played a state championship, but if we look at what's happened in the last 15 years in the state, and I'm not talking about just Gorman, but I'm talking about the buildup of some of these other programs, the Centennial basketball programs and the uh, uh, Liberty program and all these other programs that are building up and growing up. One of the problems that I see happening in our district is in the past 15 years, we are actually reducing the size of our schools. When we build a new school, we're taking away hundreds of kids from other schools. So we have schools that used to have a school population of, of 2,500. They're going to be down to 2,000 to 1,900 next year when they open up the new high school. So we're not going to have any school that's going to have a population of over 22, 21 to 2,200 kids in the next two to three years. So when you look at us as a 5A program, playing the 5A programs, just look at the number and the population. I'm not talking about competitive balance, because if we look at competitive balance based on championship playoffs over the last 15 years, you'll see that in most sports, they've been completely dominated by the South, which is fine. We've been playing those games. But the reality here is, is that the majority of our current 5A schools in the North look, smell, act, and are just like the 4A schools that are in the that are in the South. Mr. Stallworth, so yeah. If I may, I'm sorry for stepping on you, sir. A uh, couple things here. One, when the discussions were had about where the North was going to go in that last realignment committee, the first idea from the North was to start a playoff where, you know, beg your pardon, at the end of the season, the top four teams would go to 5A and the next four teams would go to 4A. And that was something the South was very much against because if I'm that four versus five playing the last game of the season, I may just tank to go to the 4A championship knowing I could win that where I couldn't win the 5A because I wasn't better than the first three teams that were there. And that became a, a pick one or the other. I, I seem to remember the vote of 7-2, I think it was, when it came about to go 5A. What I'm proposing and I don't want people to misunderstand this as, as an option. I'm not saying we need to follow through with this is that it wouldn't necessarily be on a school by school basis in the North, but the North could take a look at saying, okay, our top classification in football is going to be 4A. Our top classification in boys soccer is going to be 5A, but that needs to be decided before we start playing. It's not a matter of let's look and see how good we are and then decide what championship we want to go to. A couple other things. This there's a perception among many out there that the 5A championship is the one that matters. And yes, it is the largest classification, the largest one, but it's not the only one that matters. If you looked at the environments at our state football championships, the best environment was the 3A state championship game between Moapa Valley and Virgin Valley. And those of us who had the privilege of being there are never, ever going to forget that night and how loud that building was when those two schools played each other. Granted, long-term rivalry, that kind of stuff's going to happen, but it was just a beautiful thing. And you wish that everybody who thought once the McQueen-Gorman game was over, it's time to leave. If you could have seen that, you would have never forgotten it. I don't get too hung up on enrollment numbers either the way some people do. And I know, Mr. Stallworth, what you said is, is very true with having no more than 2,000 kids in a lot of your schools. But a lot of those 4A, a lot of the schools whose teams are playing 4A down in the South have 3,000. We have schools playing 3A right now in certain sports that have enrollments of north of 3,000. It's not about how many kids are in the school. Granted, that can certainly skew things and usually can be a pretty good indicator. 
but not always of an indicator of success. Number of people isn't always going to tell you how successful you can be. It's all over the board down here. I'm not trying to push the North one way or the other. You guys have to decide the North what's going to be best for everybody, not one school, not one championship, but for everybody across the board. And I get Mr. Parks's concerns. I really do. And I get Mr. Stallworth's concerns. It's hard to find that path. We haven't found it yet in the South. We're getting closer, but we haven't completely found that in the South. But I don't want people to get too hung up on, we've only got 1,900 kids. We can't compete with the 5A. Well, some of the 4A schools or 4A teams have 3,000. There's no real difference there. So it's about finding... And, and maybe we're, we're kind of approaching this wrong with looking at it as a state tournament. We're trying to put you in a spot where day in, day out for the two, two and a half, three months that your regular season runs, you can be the most competitive in that time. If you get the, the good fortune that everything comes together and you can go to a state tournament and compete, fantastic. We'd love to see you there. But we need to make sure that we're not killing a program by putting them in a spot where they're going to go 0 and 18 and lose by 30 every game during the regular season as well. Mr. Well, Parks, I, think, I think, I think Mr. Parks, I think wanted to jump in. I'm sorry, President Solworth. Well, I, I think that everyone agrees with you and realignment has done that. I don't think you've had that team that went 0 and 18 or any of that, but the point that you made, I think, helps my argument and that is the 3a championship game for the state championship were two southern schools playing against each other it didn't have to be a north and south and so and so i really think a a a greater 5a state championship game this year should have been liberty and 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 gorman playing for the state championship in that stadium Right. And, that, I, and I agree completely. President. That Sanders. would have been a bet. That would have been as big or not bigger of a game and audience than than the uh, than the three a game. So I think sometimes we get hung up on if we have a three a if we have a five a singleton league in the south that could still play for a state championship will be just as big as that three a game that just took place down there. Now, you might think I'm, I'm wrong on that, but I, I, I do, I do think that, um, that that kind of, of mentality that we have to have a 5A state championship in our five, in, in our largest level, because that's our largest level. Right. And, and, that, and, and that's exactly what I was saying, President Stallworth, is, it, is, is we've got to change that perception that 5A yes. is the greatest thing ever. Well, yes. yeah, a lot of those teams are really good, but we can have good matchups and good championship games in any classification. And that's where I go back to maybe the, the North is 4A in football, but 5A in boys soccer. It's a possibility. Not saying we have to do it, but it's an option for us. No, no. And I love that option. I, 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 I think, to be honest with you, I think that option solves the issue in the, in, in the North regarding the the, the, the uh, 5A, 4A situation. I think it solves that it solves that issue. And I, I truly believe and I hope that we have programs that say we want to be 5A. And, and, and uh, I'm hoping to get that information and, and, and pass that on so that we will have 5A, 4A uh, competition continuing after next year. Because you know what, Rollins, if I may as well, the whole intent of the realignment and, in, and I, hey, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm in favor of five, five classifications. It was great down here. You were down south for the state football. Oh, yeah. um, the basis of the realignment was competitive balance. And I don't want to lose sight of that. And I'm going to be honest with you too, Rollins, that this time last year, uh, well, not this time last year, but when we went through realignment, we thought that the North was coming in for it. And then I remember Tim and I had a conversation with you one day and you said, no, we're going to come, we're going to come in five A." And we were a little taken back on that to oh, be honest yeah. with you. Cause and, we and, thought, and... yeah, we thought you guys were coming in four a just based on the competitive balance that we had talked about mm-hmm. and kudos to you guys coming in five a, and I commend yes. you guys for that, but I agree. And I want the, I want the committee to be careful that if we're going to go in a different direction, 
and what and the north and I'm the north and these sports they want to participate in the 4A these sports they want to participate in the 5A we have to be careful on how we select that how we determine that and I totally agree you know survey all the northern schools in your league you know present it to the board but I also want it understood that we are not looking to make any, correct me if I'm wrong, we're not looking to make any changes for next school year. Correct. That this is the next uh, realignment cycle. cycle. Yes. Well, okay. can I chime in? <clears throat> yeah. Well, I want to make a change for next year. I want rid of that 5A soccer. And I got superintendents that are going to tell you guys they are not ready to fund those trips. So that one's going to – hell, I'm not the boss, but that's how it's going to shake out. And as you know, those 17 superintendents are the boss of the NIAA. So you're going to hear that uh, from the northern ones. Um, on the other deal, I agree 100% with you all. Uh, these schools' numbers do matter a little bit. Um, and when we talk about competitive balance, you can do all the competitive balance you want when it's a eight-hour bus ride you know, back and forth, no bus drivers, no coaches, Elko coaches driving the bus, those kind of things. Um, we are communities. So Lowry High School is a community of Winnemucca, Nevada. Elko High School is the community of Elko. Churchill County, Fallon is the community. Fernley is the community. Dayton is a community. Um, South Tahoe is Truckee. There's a few, you know, the Sparks, I still believe, fits us 100%. They are a community. Um, North Valleys has been a wonderful addition. I don't want to be splitting things up, and, and I can guarantee the 12 guys, well, not I can't guarantee it, but nine of us, there's no way we want to do 3A in football and 4A in something else. So I don't want that to be on the table. And frankly, pretty soon they're going to start saying, what, what does the NIAA do? Because, hell, we have these committees, we have leagues, and, and it doesn't seem like – what we want is happens. You know, the, I am still irritated that as a committee, we're going to do all this stuff. And then hell on the seventh, we're going to have a meeting and the board might say, okay, we're going to have you guys go single and double A soccer is going to go to the three A without us even having time to discuss that. That irritates me to death. Wondering why hell I serve as a league president and I do all this when it, it can all be for not a week from now. If I may, President Stallworth, the one thing we do need to keep in mind with this committee is this committee has basically been appointed to look at 23 through 25 for the realignment processes. Correct. We, we can't look at what's happening next year based on what this committee has been appointed to do. That, that all has to come before the Board of Control. And I know that doesn't make some people happy, but, but we are tasked with on this committee trying to come up with the policies and procedures and how we're going to go about everything for 23 through 25. Correct. And, and we need to stay focused on that. And then those other issues will be addressed by the board. But I, 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 am, I, I do want to, to, to meet and respect all of your time. I do think that, and I'm like Pam, I want to state for the record, I'm not a voting member, but I want to state for the record on the committee that I am in favor of having all five, five levels in the state of Nevada. Can we, uh, Chairman Stallworth, can we open this up to our voting members too at this point and just kind of get their thoughts, discussion here on, on the number of classifications. We talked about the success of it or lack of success in certain areas, but for, for our people here and also our, our, our liaisons or non-voting members from our charter and private schools to just kind of get their feel for, for the number of classifications. Well, if you have a list of their names, go ahead, call them well, up. If they, if they, I just let them go ahead and speak if they would like to. Maybe yes. Later. Please, we want to hear from you. Hi. Hi. Yeah, Ron, Ron Gerson from the South. Again, the realignment has worked down here in the South. We appreciate having the five uh, different levels. And we also appreciate that we can, uh, each sport within a school, to some extent, can determine what, uh, what level they're going to be playing at as well. So uh, Kevin McPartland, 5A. So just, I guess more of a, I, I completely support the five levels, 100%. Um, 
could could it be clarified for me the difference in transportation costs if the largest schools in up north are 4a or 5a won't they travel either way if, so if they just just to clarify why the, the cost would be different please the, the, the financial just situation in the South for the 5A, 4A switch has no bearing on, on uh, our transportation cost. All of our 5A schools that would, would, would possibly be 4A schools, um, would the, the transportation doesn't change. That stays the same. Even if some of those want to go 5A in some sports, the, the only time the, 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 the change would be if, if there were some sports that were 5A is, is that financially the district would be responsible for sending a 5A participant to the state playoffs and stay overnight along with the 4A representative. So that would increase the cost of my office. But, but from a district standpoint, um, the 4A, 5A wouldn't be any change. Now, some possibility and suggestions for some 3A changes could make some major changes in our uh, budget as far as transportation is concerned, because if we didn't play crossover games in our league, we wouldn't have to pay for overnight stays and we wouldn't have to pay for charter buses for the for the league games. So that would make a huge financial uh, impact on our 3A if we change that up a little bit. Okay, so, so it's, it's crossover games and then it's if we have teams up north at split in summer 5a and summer 4a and then you're paying for both yes okay so really it's it's competitive balance where you know in the 5a down south you know all but two teams are you know we're getting beat by that same amount that you guys get beat by gorman yeah. and, and liberty or centennial and you know liberty girls basketball so okay so i, I thank you for the yes. clarification on costs and, that's and it and yes. Chairman Stallworth, also, if I may, your costs have gone up a little bit, too, because we've increased the participation in state tournaments. Exactly. The North before in the largest classification would only send one team in the South. Now they send two in the largest classification in a lot of the sports. Plus, in our 5A, we've expanded those fields to be more teams in the 5A or more individuals. So your costs also went up a little bit as a result of that, I assume, sir. Exactly. So those costs hit two different um, budgets that hit my budget as the uh, director of athletics and activities in the district and then also hit the transportation budget for the district who pays for all of the league game travels. And I just want to comments? chime in for for Southern three we're absolutely in favor of the five levels. Um, I mean, I, and Tim can correct me, but it, in the very beginning of this, when we only had the four, it was a slap in the face for a few of those 4A schools to have to come to 3A uh, because we were the little schools. And then they started having success. And that's when we ballooned up to 16 teams and tried to move it to 18 teams. And we fought to get that cap down to 12 teams just to not have as many of those larger schools. So we're we're in favor of it staying the, the five levels for that reason. It gives those those middle level schools and the 4A, that opportunity to compete and the competitive balance on both levels for us has been, been great. Yeah, Mike, Mike Coe for Charter School Liaison. Um, I think I'm, I'm on board with Jay Dell's uh, comments as well. I think the, the five classifications, it spreads the competitive balance out and it provides schools and programs the ability to appeal, no matter what level you're at, to, to play you know, according to the numbers to either move up or move or possibly move down. So, um, you know, I know at the charter school level, we, we have a variety of various levels, you know, and, and a variety of various competitive levels within, you know, certain programs. So um, I think it's been a huge benefit, you know, down here for our side. Ray Parks. Yeah. Um, I fully agree. I think the five levels work fantastic for everyone. And, and I think it's, it solves a lot of the issues that we had before. As far as the, you know, Rollins talking about the money and the, the crossovers, the, the tough deal is if, so I have a 12 team league. If we don't do a crossover, you guys here in Reno can, they can fill all the games, right? You can play, 
what would be the 4A or 5A schools, you don't have a problem. If we don't have people coming out to Lowry, Elko, and Spring Creek, we won't fill those games. We won't be able to go to Idaho or go to Utah or go to anywhere. So that's why it was always so important to have crossover games. But when I make those schedules, and basically Don Walton, my AD, and myself make all the 3A North schedules, um, what we try to do is say if Sparks goes to Elko for football, the next year they go to Spring Creek for football so that you can budget out that they're only going to go that far every other year. And we're very good at that. And we're very cognizant of it. And even like my, my rant about the single and double A soccer, if that happens, and I've already talked to everyone in our league, we can make that happen. We would do two divisions. We do an East division, a West, and that would solve a lot of travel for everyone. I'm not opposed to helping all that. Um, but I've gotten to where we work so well. Jay Dell's awesome down there. Um, Dallas is awesome. Everyone's always been helpful. I like the relationships we have with the North and South. I don't want to lose any of that. But in the, up here, I mean, think about it. The Elko coach literally drives the school bus because they can't, you got to have those two drivers every 15 hours, all that stuff. So they can't get anyone. So they went back to having their coaches get licensed. So that's how committed these little schools are to playing these, these games. They're going to do anything they can. So it's very frustrating when a, a school, say, a Minogue or somebody just says, Hey, I can only play on Tuesday because we got senior night. We got this and that. I, we're not coming. I mean, those those things are almost impossible for us little schools to make happen. So I guess that's my frustration. But yeah, the 5A classification has been awesome. I, I hope we continue. I don't see why we wouldn't continue with that. We just got to figure out how we can make it. Um, you know, and you're right on the money. When it was one school coming from the north in the big leagues, now when you do two, you double the, the budgets. That's simple. One thing, when you drop to 4A, you might think about, um, hell, if you do two, again, you're going to send every single, potentially, every single Washoe County school or to say Douglas or Carson, but a lot of Washoe, to state every year. Every year, every sport. So think about that. Mr. Nelson, I know you've, you've been away for a while here, but I think we've kind of run the gamut on the number of classifications. I don't know if you want to, how you want to handle things moving on from that or what you want to do. I'll yeah, I think what we could do, um, pages 13 and 14, I think between items one, two, and three, we may be able to advance through uh, under, under classification and that'd be pages 14, I'm sorry, uh, 13 and 14 total. And then we can take a, a, a vote as an adoption from this committee. And then we can get into pages 15 through, was it 19 on the rubric and all that after that. Um, so I, I want to, are there any, any oppositions at all to 5A? I think, I think we're clear on that, right? right? I, I, I don't think there is. Okay. So, uh, Chair Stallworth, do you want to just do a motion on the classifications just to get that done? Yes. And then, uh, yeah. I, I, I would like to get a, a, a motion on the classification to keep the, uh, I need somebody the state to keep the, okay. The five yeah, classifications. Ray Parks, I make a motion to keep all five classifications for the next realignment. I second. Yep. Yep. Second. Okay. Wilson, Thank second. Thank you, Jadel. Um, we have a first and second. Are there any other questions or comments? Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? The eyes have it, and we will work through a realignment process that includes five classifications. Thank you very much. Donnie, we're going to go to um, page 15 now. No, let, let's, let's keep on 13 here. Let's go through B, state championships. Again, okay. that's for our Nevada administrative codes. Re requires nine schools to compete uh, in order for that classification to have a state championship sport. Uh, any, any issues to that? Again, that's an NAC. I don't foresee any, anybody for saying, uh, offering for change of that. We're good. Okay, let's go to number two. Bart Davis, thank you for scrolling down. Let's go to page 14 to the top of that. Uh, again, number two there, same thing. When a classification doesn't have the required number of schools to have their own state championship, those schools, uh, in essence, move to the next classification. 
And so again, that's that's part of NAC. I don't think we have any issues with that there. Uh, going okay. to going to C classification of member schools, and I'll kind of finish this section here. Um, you, you can you can read that there. We'll get the, the enrollment counts in the fall of 2022, which really almost is early winter of 2022, and that will help us get going in the process. We'll talk about policies and procedures. Uh, excuse me, procedures a little bit later with that. Um, B uh, C number one B about applying a rubric. That's what's coming on, starting on the next page, on page 15. Uh, I, we, we can look to that. We're assuming that there's still going to be, in essence, some kind of a rubric because we're, we're still looking at that for the South uh, at the minimum for 3A, 4A, and 5A. So I don't think that that gets deleted or amended the way it is. We have other factors there listed. And uh, C number two about the aligning of, of private <coughs> schools and charter and single gender schools about the enrollment of um, being doubled. That may be a topic later on for board discussion uh, with regards to a variety of things, but that, that's not present on agenda at this time. So I don't think that there's any issues there with, with C with one through two. Any questions on that, on item C, um, or I, I should say item B before it, I, item B numbers one and two, or item C numbers one and two, any, any questions there? Okay, then I think we can also tie in number three, and that's the regional league alignment. Again, you, you can read there with uh, letters A, B, C, and D, the way those are structured. Are there any oppositions to any of those or any proposed amendments in language and the way it's stated? Because if not, I think with numbers twos and threes, we could probably do a, a motion to that, which would then lead us into rubric talk. Okay, so we could get a motion for two and three to accept those yeah. as a part of the procedures and policies. That's Good. great. It's actually two B, B and C, and then and then topic and then uh, topic number Roman numeral three is what it is. Okay. So Ray Parks, I'd like to make that motion. Thank you, Ray. Do I have a second? Ron Gerzon, I'll second. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion? Rollins, Brett Walter. Yeah, Brett. I just wanted to bring up, uh, uh, Mr. Darrow can probably speak to it better than I, but uh, you know, just on this uh, topic, uh, the Meadows uh, usually comes up uh, each time where when they are doubled, uh, you know, they, I believe last time petitioned uh, back to the 2A, the 2A had no issues with that. I don't know if that will affect any of those other private schools. The 2A league has the, the most private schools in their league um, with Lake Mead, uh, with uh, Calvary, Mountain View. There's, there's, there's quite a few private schools in there. So I don't know if there's, you know, if they'll have to just go through that process again, or, or if past precedent would allow them if their enrollment hasn't changed. I just wanted to bring that up before there was a vote made. Okay. Mr. Walter, I can, I can speak to that. That's, I appreciate your comments, but I'm glad you brought that up. And with, within this process that they would have to then come back in front of the board and, and appeal. And they could get the same, same process we did last time. The league may or may not uh, provide a, a recommendation for adoption by the board for, for a school on a school by school basis or a group of schools into a particular league, but there would be a, an ultimate approval at the board level for that. Same, same process. Thank you, Brett. Hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, with that said, Chair Stahl, I think we're back to the vote then, finishing off uh, item two, letters B and C, and then item three, letters A through D. I okay, think so all, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it, thank you very much. We'll move to the next agenda item. Yeah, th thank you, Chair Stahl. Let's, let's move to page 15, and we're gonna look at a variety of things here with regards to rubric. And this will take us pages 15 through 19. And I am going to turn it over to our, our wonderful coordinator of sports, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bart Davis. And thank you, Mr. Nelson. I appreciate that. Kind of caught me just in a little bit of a phone call there. I apologize. Uh, hey, Bart, let me interrupt you for one second then. As you get settled, I'll give you, give you 30 seconds here. Um, the very first item that Mr. Davis will address with all of you at the very top, and this this is, you know, we'll get into formulas and all that here in a minute. But the very first one is going to be about the 
the number of seasons, the number of school years used in the rubric process. So, so that way, Mr. Davis, give you a second to catch your breath and know where we're going to start with this thing, because I know that was your first topic on this. Uh, this, is a, this is a big one. So, Mr. Davis, if you're ready, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, that was something that we discussed back in September when we had our workshop, is the number of years that we would, uh, we would use, number of data years we would use to determine where schools would go in the rubric. In the past, we used four. And the reason for that was to look at how a team was trending. Um, one direction or another in case we had teams that were in the bubble range. If we look back at four years now, 2022-23 being the last year, that would be next year, 21-22 the current year, and then the two years before it, there, there's some significant holes in there because of the pandemic. 2020-2021, most of the state did not have a fall season. All of the state did not have a winter season. We did have a spring season. It was very abrupt. 2019, 2020, we did play fall, we played winter, but we did not have a spring season. It was cut off that second week of March where some teams got a few games in and that was it. What this committee has the option to do is to maybe take this down to using two years worth of data. The most current two years, which would be 21, 22 and 22, 23. That, in my opinion, not trying to persuade the committee one way or the other, would give you the most recent data. We're never going to get perfect data because 2022, 2023 may be a year that a team has a whole bunch of seniors, has a whole lot of success. All those seniors graduate and you're left with nothing left. If you look at maybe Centennial football as an example, they went to the state championship game back in 2019 and had exactly one kid left from that team this year. It was their kicker and Centennial really struggled. Never going to be perfect, but the closer we get to current, the better off you're going to be. Plus, we have full 21, 22, 22, 23 data by the time we get done. Knock on wood that we don't have to shut anything down. And we're also at that point, everybody's in the classification they're in for those two years. They're not jumping classifications in between. So I think those are some options that maybe we look at too. You could certainly look at four. We're not getting rid of past data by any means. We'll still have it if people want to go back and look to see how a team is trending. We have that data from past years. Maybe we don't quite include it in their rubric score because it's well, not very recent data. And maybe we tighten that up to two, but I, I, I'm, I'm kind of skewing the committee here one, one direction, which I don't mean to do. But that's an option for us, is to go with two as opposed to four. The committee's got the option to go with one, three, six, any number of years of data. But two, when we're in that same realignment cycle the entire time, seems to make a little bit more sense, at least on my end, as the guy who's putting numbers in. And I don't, I don't want to get too deep into the argument of whether or not the North's going to use the rubric or not. That's really immaterial to how many years that we use of data. And I'll open it up at this point for, for questions, for discussion from our, our voting and non-voting members. Hey, Bart Ray Park. So with all the instability of COVID, this is strictly my opinion. I have not talked to a soul about it. If we finally decide and we settle on, you know, we've settled on five classifications, hopefully we, we decide on what um, the North's going to do, 5A or 4A. Would it make sense to once we make a decision, just go four years so there's actually some stability? So that like you're talking about, you know, like Bob brought up down there, these schools are waiting to come in and, and we want to come in a real alignment cycle and they had to wait extra. Well, that's mainly because of all these messes that keep coming. In my opinion, we settle on everything and go four years and actually have some stability. But again, just my opinion. I think, Ray, the thing that we saw when we had a four-year alignment, when we first started this process of moving teams around, Del Sol football is what sticks out. And Tim Jackson, feel free to chime in on this. Del Sol football had one really good year and got to a state championship game and got punished for it because they lost everybody and were in the higher classification for a long, long period of time with no shot at going down. I think if we look at this on two years and two years of data all the time, you're always comparing yourself against the teams that you played most recently. You weren't moving classifications in that time. And I get what you're saying about stability, 
But I think if we're looking at this as a competitive balance standpoint, your ability to compete is going to fluctuate. And we want to make sure that we're putting teams when we can, where we can, in the spots that they can be the most competitive. We don't want to put a team in a spot where using four years of data. And Clark, Clark basketball is another good example that we had in this last cycle. Clark had three fabulous years in the 3A mm -hmm. and won three straight state titles. Then lost a lot of kids who transferred somewhere else. And we had this discussion with the last committee and with the board of where they should go. They were number two in points over four years. Over two years, they were number eight in points. And the argument for them to go to 4A was at least a little bit more convincing using two years of data than it was using four years of data. Well, you don't want to get me started on that. Elko had the probably the best basketball team in the North, period, mm -hmm. uh, all those years with those guys. Yep. But um, there's also, why couldn't we put in there, it's a four-year realignment, but they can appeal every two years so that you can do that situation. Because what I'm getting at here is to save basically Washoe County, Elk is going to keep growing. So is uh, Fernley. So every two years, you're going to start hearing that these Washoe County guys got to drive out to Elko every year. And that's, you want to talk about a budget, you send every single Washoe County school plus Carson plus Douglas, you know, plus, uh, I guess, Minogue, all them out to Elko, all them out to Spring Creek, all them out to Fernley. It's going to be financially impossible to do that. So if you did a four-year, you can budget the whole Marianne. You know where everybody's going to sit. You know, I'll be long gone. Rollins will probably be long gone, but at least we left with some stability. That's well, my I, thought up here. I man. get down south. I, I, I fully understand that you guys need to move around. So, but I just think there should be an appeals process where they can move in two years, but some stability for budgeting for us. Well, and, and I will, I appreciate that comment, Mr. Parks. Thank you. And I can just counter that with, they, if we do two years, they can appeal in the two years as well to stay where they're at up north and, and plan that way. I don't, again, this is something that we have to determine through this process. Do we even use the rubric? for the North, which it wasn't intended to be in the first place. If we get away from that, then the discussion on what, how many years of data we use is a completely moot point for the North. It applies only to the South at that point. And again, I think if we look at the data in this, I, I, I hate to go by two different sets of rules. I always hate to do that in anything, but the North's a different animal than the South is. And we've well, all heard those discussions. I think you guys, I truly believe you need the rubric in the South. I mean, how else could you do something with that many schools? But I never wanted anything to do with it up here. And, and when you bring up South Tall and Truckee, I get, there's a whole lot of backstory there. Um, but the Rubik, for me anyway, it does not work in the North. I don't know what Rollins, if he disagrees with that, but it certainly doesn't work for me. Well, it serves our purpose when we look at the, the, the attempt to balance out the the 12 teams in the South and then, uh, and, excuse me, in the 3A and the uh, nine teams or the, the six Washoe County, seven Washoe County schools in the, uh, in the, in the current 5A. So it does help in, in terms of distinguishing those schools that possibly need to go to the 3A. So it does help us out in terms of identifying who those schools are. So, and we would only use it in, the, in, in that particular purpose. Again, I think that um, Elko is, is a different animal, and I, and I really think that um, unless the Fallons and the Fernleys of the world get amazing populations of over 15, 1,600 kids, if that takes place, I don't think that there's a board member or anyone in the North that would, would not vote to have Elko stay in the 3A for as long as they want to, as long as the 3A wants them. And um, I think that's I think that's an easy call. It's been a, historically, it's been that type of a situation with them. And I don't think Elko would ever leave the 3A unless the 3A, especially the old guard 3A schools, said they need to get out of there. Well, and as you said. Chairman Stallworth, the Elko situation in a roundabout way is very similar to the Meadows situation that Mr. Walter referenced down here, 
where Meadows has consistently been over the number in terms of the 2A, 3A cut off, but the 2A welcomes them back in. They're, they've been a good league member. I don't mean to speak for Mr. Darrow in this, but that's what's happened year in and year out. What we've got going on in the South, and again, this was all part of the discussion of what does the North want to do? This was really the, the kind of the crux of a lot of this today is does this even apply to the North? Because if it doesn't apply to the North and the North wants to handle things differently, then this discussion is entirely South-based for how we do the rubric. If the North wants to still include the rubric in some way to determine teams that would play in a different classification than other teams, then the North's included in all this discussion as well. So it, it goes hand in hand here, but I think we need to stick for right now on the number of years of data that we would use. Again, keeping in mind, we are missing a full season. If we go back to four years, a full season for every sport. And in some cases we're missing a full season and probably half of a season. Bart, Mr. N Mr. Nelson, I see you're back too. Mr. Jackson, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's all right. Bart, um, one of the arguments we had when we had the appeal for Clark basketball was that we were using data when they were in the 3A. Yep. And we had we had to use the data we had available. There was no fault of anybody there and it made sense. Uh, the Del Sol football fiasco, we all know what happened there. We also know what happened when the realignment went geographically instead of rubric based in the Northeast in football. Uh, that was years ago. Uh, you, you can't draw a line in the sand and say everybody to the left is good and everybody to the right is not. So it didn't work. We found that out real quick. So what I think we should do is use the best data available. And apples to apples will always be apples to oranges. We have two years of apples to apples. We should use the best data available for the next realignment. After that realignment, we'll have four years of apples to apples in theory. And if that's the case, maybe we can use the four. I think the four years of data for appeal-based decisions is the best way to go. Two years of data for realignment and then if you're appealing, we look at four years. And now we've used as much data as we have available. I think that would have helped Clark in this situation with basketball. It definitely would have helped Del Sol football years ago. But that's my two cents. I do agree that the decision has to be made what the North is going to do, because if they're not going to follow this, this is a Southern discussion. Well, and, and Mr. Jackson, I will say too, that if we're going to let, if we're going to set up, not we, if the board is going to set up um, a, a passageway through the knack that schools can come in on the years that start a realignment cycle. If we go with two years, that's going to allow those teams that come in to be competitive as soon as possible. But it's also going to keep that data for those teams. They're going to have two years of data after two years pass the same way everybody else's. We're not going to have to have two empty years the way we had the last time that we went around for some of the schools that, that had just started up. Mr. Nelson, you see you're back. Yeah, I, Mr. Stallworth and I are concurrently working on something. So we, I, I'll speak on behalf of him as well as we apologize. We have to keep stepping out. Immediate demands require that. So uh, no, I, I think we're the boat where we, we take a, a vote or for, you know, again, recommendation to the board about the number of years. We start there and then uh, we can turn it back over and going through formulas and all that here in a little bit to whatever degree we need to. But let, let's, let's start with a, a vote on number of years. I make a motion that we use two years of data for realignment purposes when using the rubric. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Do we have a second? R Ron Gerzon, I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Gerzon, second. All right, well, let's open it up for any, uh, any further discussion. I can go right through our voting membership here just to, to ask for comments so people don't have to trip over each other and want to do that. Uh, Ken Higby, any, any nope. comments? Okay. Uh, David Vick, back in? I don't believe so. Mike Strong? And again, I realize by tying in the 1A and 2A, we're, we're not um, bringing in people that have direct effect to it, but they are voting members. So, Mike Brooks? Come on, uh, I think two years is fine. Bill Darrow? Two or five. Yeah, I think the, the four years is fine. Just that, you know, I don't think we all need to fully understand those 1A and 2A are not involved in any rubric. Yeah, correct. No, I, I agree. 
I understood. And I said, but I want to make sure there's not something I'm missing with, with any one of our five representatives from the 1A or 2A total. Ray Parks, two years? Uh, you Comments? heard mine. I'd rather have four just so that we can budget these things. Everybody keeps talking these philosophies, but it gets down to dollars. And if we can't give these superintendents an actual budget, they're going to start being real easy at just canceling things. So that's where I'm at. Mr. Wilson? I'm good with two. Okay. Mr. Gerzon, you already made a, a second on it. Mr. McPartland? It, my comments would be uh, definitely two for us, but I'm not against the idea that maybe for stability, the, that the, the North needs a different time frame for it, but um, for, for me too. Uh, Mr. Jackson, you made the motion, and Mr. Anderson? No, I'm good. Okay. So we, again, we have a, a motion on the table. We have a second. I'll call for the question, uh, and we'll, let's go all those in favor say aye. Do that first. Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, do we have an opposition? Anybody a nay? I'm a nay. I've got one nay. Make sure I don't miss any other ones. Uh, one nay for Mr. Parks. Anybody else on a nay? All right. Motion will pass then for uh, two years, and that's what we'll take as a recommendation to, to the board as adoption from the committee. All right. Um, Mr. Davis, I'm going to go back to you then, and I'm going to ask you how much time you want to spend with the committee on formulas, again, not knowing exactly who they're going to impact or not impact or to what extent north or south. No. I, do, you want, do you want to do a summary on this or we have some questions on the individual base sports? I'm, I'm going to kind of yield to you at this point. Yeah, sir. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Nelson. It, I don't want to get too terribly in the weeds with this because it, it can be confusing for people that haven't been terribly familiar. You can see it in your packet, what we use. It's not as daunting as it looks, I will tell you that much. Uh, we do have class, we, we take into account winning percentage, strength of schedule, which is two different factors, your opponent's winning percentage and their opponent's winning percentage. We have factors for playoff wins and we have factors for non-competitive losses. Those are in our team standings based sports. We do have an adjustment factor. If you're playing, if a 5A school is playing a 4A school in a non-league game, um, we need to get a little more into that. I think 5A, 4A, 3A, because we have three classifications this time around, but you can go through your packet and see um, everything that describes that. Our individual base sports are scored a little bit differently. Uh, cross country is taking all the region meets, throwing them together as though they were one meet and scoring it that way. Again, I don't want to go too terribly deep. Golf is one we had a question on, and I think we've kind of solved this, but we do have now situations where teams are playing nine hole matches in leagues, especially in the South because of the lack of availability of courses. And we have just, the, the schools themselves, the leagues themselves are just doubling the scores in a lot of cases. So if a, a player goes out and shoots a, a 40 for nine holes, it becomes an 80 for 18 holes. It's not really what they shot because they didn't play 18 holes but they're using that to figure their, um, their league standings, their points for who qualifies for postseason anyways. I'm fine with using that for a rubric to pretend it's an 18 hole score. We can simply just do an average score by nine holes. I don't know that that's gonna change anything a whole lot. You can see swimming and diving, you can see track and field, and you can see wrestling. We do have a couple of sports where we combine boys and girls into one. Tennis is one of those. And that's one we need to discuss maybe in just a little bit. Bowling is another. And we have those set up that way because we have generally in the South, one coach that coaches both teams and to split them up could be a logistical nightmare. Now there's been talk amongst the tennis coaches down here, some of them that maybe because those tennis coaches are receiving two stipends, Maybe it's time that they find somebody to coach one of the other teams and try to do what's best for the kids overall. The North, again, if they're going to be a part of this rubric and we, that's up to the North. The North has separate coaches for boys and girls tennis in most cases. There's a school or two, I think, that might have one coach for both programs. I believe Truckee does, for one, have one coach for both programs. So maybe we don't need to tie tennis together but I don't think there's a whole lot unless the, the, the group has any questions on how we figure out the rubric scores. 
Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them and try to guide you through the process. Mr. Nelson doesn't have a hand in this because technology is not always his friend. So he turns out all that over to me. Indeed. Yeah, let's open it up again. This is Mr. Davis just said so far. And uh, what, what a backhanded comment, my friend. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I, I told you that's why we hired you from the very beginning, right? To be our rubric coordinator. That's how it all started, whatever it was, four or five years ago in doing all this. So uh, again, yeah, open up to the floor. Any, any questions for, for Mr. Davis on how we calculate these things? And then I'll come back to Mr. Davis in a minute about a course of action from this point. So any questions? Floor's open. Bart, Bart um, I, I know we've had this discussion a couple of times about the weight factor for a non-competitive loss compared to a weight factor for a school that doesn't feel the team. Where we have that is in really the only place where we say school that doesn't feel the team is a couple different sports, tennis gets a real little bit iffy in there. If you don't field six kids, right, you technically forfeit. We say that forfeits don't go into the equation. That's the exception to the rule. Right. Tennis, it has to. That's the non-competitive loss in tennis. You didn't have enough kids to post a team score. You are non-competitive. You couldn't have won. No matter what happens, you couldn't have won that match. So that goes into play for a non-competitive loss in, in tennis. Other sports where that non-competitive loss comes into play. They are all the standings-based sports, and they are all basically where the mercy rule kicks in, right? 35 points for football, 35 points for basketball, eight goals for soccer, 10 runs for baseball and softball. That non-competitive loss is basically the value of one half of a game, where a playoff win is the value of one full game. If you don't compete at all during the season, you don't have a rubric score right? In a, in a basketball or baseball or softball. If you have five kids on your tennis team all year, you have nothing but non-competitive losses all year long. You're going to be at the bottom of your classification. And the one thing we do need to say too, is we are at the end of this creating a full list of teams who are eligible for movement. Teams with the highest score, they go to the 5A. Teams with the next highest scores go to the 4A. The 3A is based right now on teams that qualify their enrollment wise. And then where there is room, the bottom scoring teams that would be eligible for 4A. Mr. My, Jackson? My, my concern is we're seeing it. I, I, I want to make sure I say this correctly. So let's take a team that's only got five in tennis. Yep. And eventually what's going to end up occurring is they're going to end up somewhere above a team that has no participants. And my fear is, if you see where I'm going with this, I'm, I'm extrapolating this out. You take some to the 5A, you take some to the 4A, what you're going to be left with is a big gap of no participants, four participants, and you're going to have, you see where I'm at, Bart? I see where you're at, but you're also reminded of what I want to get to eventually. Okay. Which is the possibility of those 3A enrollment-based schools that we right now say are 3A regardless of having them move to 4A. And tennis is the perfect example. Yeah. Because we look at the Meadows in Boulder City and Moapa Valley, which had successful teams. They fielded basically full teams in the 3A and not a whole lot of other schools did. So they didn't have the chance to compete against those schools. If Meadows and Boulder City and Moapa Valley all would have gone to 4A, they might have had a chance to win 4A. Don't know if they would have or wouldn't have, but they would have had more games, more matches, where they could have played all nine kids against somebody. What we also had in the 4A this year because of coming back off the pandemic, I want to say it was seven boys teams in the 4A that did not field full teams and forfeited every match. And if that holds true again next year, we're going to have 11, 12, 13 schools maybe that for two years never put six kids on the court. So I get what you're saying there, Mr. Jackson, but it's also part of the discussion of do we look at the possibility of having those protected 3A schools be eligible to move to 4A? I would not ever want to force them into 5A. It's an option much like slam wrestling did try to petition and successful in that petition, move all the way to five, a wrestling that option exists for them, but
But that's something we discussed back in September too in our workshop is do we wanna have the ability for a Pahrump, for a Virgin Valley, for a Moapa, for a, a, a Coral Academy, for a SLAM to be included in there where they could move to 4A as part of the normal rubric score. And in a sport like tennis, theoretically, it puts them in a spot where they're gonna be more competitive with everybody else on a daily basis. My concern then is what happens to the North versus South state championship. Correct. As we get to that number. I, I see this as, in, as a trickle down effect, eventually getting correct. to the point where we may end up with a hole. You are correct in that. Okay. Yes. And that's, and that's something where, again, we hope if the rubric does what it's supposed to do and increase participation numbers, we're never going to fix it at some schools because the demographic of the school is not maybe leaning that way where it's a little bit more difficult to get kids who've played tennis before out to play tennis. It's a little different than if you're at Palo Verde, which you know has no problem getting numbers any year, or Coronado does. So yeah, I, I definitely see your point. I don't think it's something we're going to encounter right away, but it's something that it could happen down the road where we just don't have any full teams left in the 3A. If we can put them in spots now where those kids at least can be competitive against each other, we're hoping that builds the program. More kids come out and then you can actually get to six, seven, eight, maybe nine kids. And my other question would be, is there any flavor to realigning tennis based on individual as opposed to team? It could be. I'm just not sure how you score it. I don't point. either. I, because I'm, I, what I'm thinking of is the school that's got four tennis players as opposed to school that has none. They both end up at the bottom together. But to me, the team with four was a stronger performer than a team with zero. And, and, and tennis being that individual slash team sport, you do have that issue too, where you could legitimately have the best player in the state on a team that doesn't have enough kids to actually be a team. And are you putting that kid in the best possible spot? And the same thing could be happen in wrestling. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion on how we go about getting the rubric scores for teams and then how the process starts of where we place them? Mr. Davis, hearing nothing, uh, I'm going to ask you, do you feel like we should go section by section starting on page 15? And so pages 15 and 16, those are, are general components. Go to pages 17, 18, and 19, we start going a little bit sport by sport. Do you feel like we're in a position where we can adopt something right now with this committee? Mm -hmm. The way it looks right now, yes. on those pages... I don't see why we can't. One of the issues in here obviously is going to be tennis and what we choose to do with that. Do we split that up? But on pages 15 through 19, as I look at it here, there's nothing on those pages that refers to whether tennis should be combined, boys correct. and girls, or kept separately. That's correct. And that's why I asked you. I almost think what we have there, and, and I know... I think it's pretty clear we're going to have another meeting and we'll, let's, let's get through this part. We'll talk about procedures here in a minute and maybe we, there's a lot of really big, heavy information on that, which was some other questions, but just in the immediate here and now on these pages, you know, if, if I go to, for example, golf, you know, the question on nine hole matches, I, I, we can create nine or 18. We can put par of 35 or 70. We can do that today and build this into it and still, still approve it as an adoption or a recommendation to the board. Swimming and diving, same thing too. I think we can talk about a number of scores if that, if that is our, our, our question. I know we have a little note at the bottom here. Um, again, I don't want to rush this committee into anything. I don't want to rush you, Bart, into anything. It seems like for this process of finishing out the policies, I, I almost think we can do that. And maybe we go pages 15 and 16 first, and then we go sport by sport after that to finish pages 17 through 19. And tennis does come back and can be added later. Uh, you know, that, that's not, not a problem, especially if we assume we're going to meet again prior to our March board meeting. What do, you, what do you think? First of all, do we have any questions from our, especially our newer committee members too, that weren't a part of this process two years ago, three years ago, whenever it was now, um, of how we went through this? I remember sitting at breakfast with Mr. Thompson explaining all this to him and just seeing the smile on his face when he 
when he finally understood all the math and it all lit up for him. But if you have any questions on, on how we do this or why we do it a certain way, before we even get into the adoption of this, maybe maybe it's best now to, to go ahead and, and air those questions and try to get them solved for you. If there are none, then Mr. Nelson, I, I the way it sits, I wouldn't have a problem going forward with this. It's, it's up to the, to the voting members of the committee. So voting members, if you want, again, you're hearing nothing at this point, we can go 17, 18, and 19, finish those sports, and then make it one collective motion, which would include pages, the, the information on pages 15 and 16. Do if, if you want to do that? Well, that would sure help us with the process of, of eliminating some time in the next meeting. Okay. So I, I really think that um, we just need a motion and a second and discussion and vote. All right, so Bart, let, let's go back to page 17 then, okay, if you would, please. Cross country, anything on there, Mr. Davis, that you think needs to be amended for that score? No, uh, we've actually already gone through and, and figured out the scoring for this yep. past year. We, we have one more region meet than we had in the past is all in the South. So nothing needs to change. Okay, bowling, Mr. Davis? Simplest way is the team's average pin total in regular season matches because yep. not everybody makes the playoffs. We're good. Okay. Golf, uh, do you want me to do a nine slash 18 hole regular season matches and then the par of at least 35 slash 70? Is, is that, and then the double par of plus nine slash plus 18? Is, is, that, is that the answer to that to our, to our nine hole match question? As best as the answer as we're going to get, I believe so, yes. Okay. If that's the flavor of the committee. Okay, so I, I will build that into the minutes when we do that for golf. All right, swimming and diving, Bart, we're missing one thing on there about number of scores. How do we want to address that at this point, if we do? We did have to change some things here for place points, and that yep. was something that the formula that we set up. And I think maybe that's, um, we, we need to take a closer look at that to make sure we have the number of scores correct and develop a formula for that. So maybe we need to hold swimming and diving and track and field out of this and improve everything else until we have a scoring system that everybody can take a look at because the scoring systems for the North, if the North were to use the rubric in the South are not going to be the same here. Okay, so we will, that's noted on page 18 for swimming and diving and track and field then. We will hold those for a spring meeting and then we go to uh, wrestling then on page 19. And wrestling, we have to stay within the classification here. There's just no way to cross classification and, and the, um, the last committee approved two up, two down for a number of teams, kind of like a, a relegation um, in European soccer. Um, but I don't think anything needs to change here either. Okay, all right, with that said committee, then what I would present to you is we'll be looking for a motion to approve the contents of pages uh, under, under the rubric used for the realignment process, the contents of pages 15, 16, 17, golf as amended for on page 18, holding off on swimming and diving and track and field on page 18 and then wrestling on page 19. Hopefully that all makes sense. Um, do we have, do we have a motion as, as without anybody having to describe it again, I guess somebody can say what, what he said. <laughs> yeah. Ray Parks. I'd like to make that motion on what Donnie had just described. I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Second. All right. Any further discussion, questions or comments? I don't see anything in chat. I don't see anybody's hands going up anywhere. All right. With that said, we'll call for the question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody in uh, any of our members in opposition? All right. Well, that gets us a start then. We know we know a couple items that we'll be bringing back uh, for this for the spring meeting, and we'll we'll arrange that here in a little bit. So. Where we are as of now then is we're to, to procedures and there are a lot of significant questions uh, in here and this is gonna take a, um, my humble opinion, a tremendous amount of time. And I, I don't, I don't wanna dissuade this also, I also wanna be respectful of the people's schedules. Uh, I, I do believe we need to meet in March. Do we as a committee wanna take a five minute break and come back and proceed on this? Or do we want to set up something and, and make this a, a significant 
meeting. It's probably going to take a couple hours. I, again, I could be wrong. Could be wrong. But I think this is probably the procedures will probably take a couple hours. And this may be minus the uh, couple things that we'd be bringing back. And we want to make this a, a standalone spring meeting prior to our board meeting. Uh, I, I want to hear some opinions on that. I would certainly like to make it another meeting because I got to get on the road. I I don't know. I can't do two more hours. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to spend a little time on it to get it right. Let me let me go through. Um, uh, let me let me ask, Mr. Wilson. What what do you think? Yeah, I agree with Ray. I'd I'd prefer a spring meeting on it, a standalone. Okay, Mr. Gears on. I'm open either way, Donnie. Okay, thank you, Mr. McPartland. I'd prefer a second meeting. Okay, Mr. Jackson. Same second meeting. Okay, and let me go to uh, again. That's not to. I know with our one A three voting members and our two A. Uh, obviously, they have a significant vested interest as well. This just brings back into 1A, 2A in discussions. Um, but I, I, there will certainly be falling some 3A, 4A, 5A specific discussions. Uh, any, anybody from our 1A or 2A voting membership that wants to comment about being okay to hold off until the spring? We, we need a Mike? second meeting. Second meeting, Ken? Okay. Yeah, yeah if we're, if we're not going to finish it, we might as well have the next meeting and move on. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I think, again, I think we are going to have a spring meeting, just some things we already know we need to bring back, and we know we need to have some discussions uh, take place within the 5A North. Um, uh, to our, Mr. Stallworth, you, you're you back on there. Are you, uh, are you, yeah, are you okay if we look? I'm, towards, I'm back on. Yeah, are you okay if we look towards holding the procedures for another? Yes, another I, I think that'd be a great idea, and it'll give us a little bit more focus. We kind of went all over the place today, and... <laughs> Yeah. I think that meeting will give us a real good, clear focus, and, and we can get that done. Okay. Ms. Sloan? No, I agree. Okay. And anything from um, Brett or Mike, private charter schools? Any questions, comments, concerns? Nope. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think Let having a, a dedicated meeting would be beneficial. Okay. Thank you. So we're So we did this on a Tuesday. Uh, I know we need to get through the winter season. We've got a lot of breaks coming up and then we get into the, the heavy league schedule and the playoffs, you know, January through February. Uh, I think this needs to take place right at the beginning of March. We need to, right after our state tournament. Um, I can go grab Let me go grab a, par pardon me for one minute. Let me, let me kind of grab a calendar real quick and see if I can throw out some dates at you. I want my work. Give me, pardon me one, one second. Okay. I will also say to this committee too, if you if you do have questions on on numbers, right now we have not posted any numbers from the fall, and it was largely because we didn't know if we were going to use two years of data or four years of data, which is the reason why you're not seeing totals up right now. We'll have those totals up for you. Um, I I don't want to give you an exact date, as, as you know, we're playing a little bit from behind, as you all are. But if you have questions about any of the process at all and how, how that came about by all means, contact us at any time. And for those listening in for the public too, the, the same goes. We're, this is a very open process. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Yeah, well said. All right, everybody is a, I gathered a Tuesday was better than a Monday just because after a weekend, everybody's really stuck in the building and trying to recover from what may or may not have happened uh, over, over a break period or over a couple of days out of the building. So it seems like a Tuesday is a good day to get settled on a Tuesday morning. Uh, everybody agree with that? Tuesday morning, same as we did today? Yes. Yep. Okay. So we certainly have March 1st. Um, that is probably going to be a very busy time for a lot of you getting ready for spring sports to commence with a contest. Uh, March 8th is still two weeks in advance of our, our spring board meeting, which is scheduled for the 22nd, 23rd. I think that gives us enough time to get through this and still craft a, a hearing uh, for the schools with regards to what this committee will bring forth. It'll, it'll happen fast between the 8th and the 22nd, but I think we can do that. Does Tuesday the 8th seem like a, a fair date? I want to make sure. I don't think we have any spring breaks that early, anything like that. Tuesday the 8th of March. Thumbs up, Tuesday the 8th of March. Okay. And look at same same time frame, 9 o'clock, and I assume we'll probably go to about 11.30, probably, probably about right around the same time frame. you got to be ready to dedicate that, that morning to this process. Okay. All right. I'm going to, 
I'm going to note that down then. We're going to look at Tuesday, March 8th at 9 o'clock to get through the procedures. And Bart Davis, we have some, you and I have come up with some other questions. I, before we exit here in just a few minutes, I want to make sure we, we look at these and what we still need to address so people think about. Them. Number one, obviously, go through the procedures, people, what you have here. Be ready to come to that meeting in advance. Uh, you, you have it here. Some things we'll have to certainly amend in advance. Um, Bart, you, you and I, some of the questions we had about uh, enrollment-based 3A schools, being eligible to move to 4A, that comes into procedures. We've got to be ready to talk about that. ELCO and cutoff numbers. Obviously, that's going to be part of what we look at here in, in, in numbers. And that, that's, just, that's not to pick on one particular school. That's the same thing as the year ending factor we mentioned before. But we got to be ready to address those kind of things. <coughs> um, tennis, right? We talk about northern tennis in splitting up boys and girls in rubric points. And the possibility of doing that in the south as well, if they were to, if the southern coaches decide that's something that they want to, instead right. of coaching both programs, have a second coach so that the, the teams are in better position to compete. Correct. Mr. Davis, any other topics that you just want to verbally put out there for people to be ready to put in the back of their minds as they look at the procedures area and we come back on March 8th? Some of the other concerns that we had back in September were finding out that they're either going to take care of themselves or there's just no possible way to take care of it because of the lack of, of, of uh, cross-classification games at this point. I think if we were to, to, to get into that, really look at the enrollment numbers and see what we want to do with those. Granted, schools can come back and appeal regardless, but I think where that enrollment cut, cutoff comes, the 3A schools in the South especially, if you look at the possibility of moving to 4A, and maybe that's something that between Mr. Kofer, Mr. Walter, Mr. Wilson, who represent some of those schools, kind of take a look at that and find out from your membership if that's something they're even willing to entertain, if it would put them in a better spot where they can have more competitive games against more teams. If we can hit that and get through all the stuff that's listed in the procedures, I think we're going to be in pretty good shape. All right. Uh, just a note before we exit for today, uh, Rollins, I think you've disappeared for a second. Uh, Pam, if you would, please, would you also stay on the Zoom? Let, not to stay on right away. Take a, take a break. Let's come back in 15 minutes, okay? I'll text Rollins. Rollins, there you are. Hey, I'm Rollins, here. before we exit, just would you and I've asked Pam, uh, so, so Bart or Lori running the meeting, don't shut us off on that, please. <laughs> so we, we need to speak as a, as a, as a president and vice president of our board with, uh, with myself and you know, I can have another staff member stay on here too. That's, that's not a problem for Lori and Bart Davis. Anyway, I just want to say that has nothing to do with this process, just for those. So let's get that because I think we need to be on Zoom this way. All right. With that said, for the greater good, any last questions or comments from anybody? Yeah, Don, Donnie, I have a couple things. Um, and I'm not sure that if this is for the realignment committee or this is for the new membership committee or the NIAA issue, but at three things. I want to bring back a comment that Billy Darrell made earlier in regards to a new member. And he's absolutely right, because we have a lot of these brand new schools that are coming aboard and all they have is one female, one male cross country runner, same thing for track. And then they claim they have a bowling team and then they have two females and a male. Now, technically that qualifies them as being a full member because you just have to have representation and two per sport. That has to change because that becomes a scheduling nightmare for, and I know I live this when I did schedules and Tim lives it every day right now. And that's a huge disadvantage when you're trying to put, when you're trying to put schedules together and then now we're looking at postseason. It's just, that is just not right. It's not right, it's not fair. So I'm not sure if that's a discussion that we need to have here with the realignment or the new, the new member committee my second uh, thing, my second point or comment is when I come in as a full member and I commit to playing these particular sports, I have to commit in participating in those sports for at least the two year cycle. We had a situation year, a few years ago where a school, a charter school came aboard and they said, we want to play boys volleyball. Well, they played the one year boys volleyball, they took state, and then the following year they said, eh, we're not gonna have boys volleyball this year. That's not fair, that's not right. 
Again, we need consistency. And the third part, and again, I'm not sure if this is a realignment issue or we have to take it to another facet here, but we have to start having consequences for schools that drop programs. And I'm not saying, and I'm gonna speak on behalf of CCSD. Does CCSD offer every level, every program? Shoot, it's some, I think we had a, we didn't have a varsity, we didn't have a golf team this year, which is unacceptable in, in, in my world, but there has to be consequences for schools that drop programs, because that affects the schedule, that affects the rubric, you know, and that affects a lot of things. It's, it's not that simple and that easy. And I think some people do. And some people want to come in, well, we don't have enough golfers, so we're going to run cross country this, this year. Tim, I don't know if you want to speak on that or if this is the platform to do that, Donnie. But I think those three things, we need to have a discussion. And I'm not sure which avenue we need to start having that discussion. Donnie, I'll defer to you. Uh, Pam, I think what you said have, has been on the minds of many school administrators, uh, not just at the district levels, which you represent, Rollins represents. Um, I, I think we could have, I think we can agendize that item within the Spear Alignment Committee as a starting point. And maybe, maybe this committee will have some insights on how we structure, you know, an NAC around that. So, no, I, I think... Um, I think we can make that an agenda item specifically within this. And again, talking about what, what Mr. Darrell said about team, team based sports, is that going to be a requirement? Is that something again, and this, this committee obviously is not going to make that ultimate decision, but maybe this committee can make some, you know, some recommendations to the board and uh, about being consistent and about having continuity of a program, not having it to get in and then dropping it. And what would be consequences to that? Now, I, I think that's maybe this is the place to start. We've never thought about that, right? Starting with this group because it is a realignment issue. And that's the fundamental basis of realignment in schools and leagues and regions and classifications. So no, let's, let's start it here. I, I'm gonna note that and we're gonna make that an agenda item for- Yeah, because again. everyone that is part of this call, you guys are the ones that are impacted yeah. by, by schools that make these decisions or come in and do these things. Yeah, yep, I like it, thank you. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments for the greater good? Donnie, can I make a comment real quick, just based on uh, our public comment earlier, so that this whole committee knows where the two-way stands on that public comment. I sent out a deal to the entire two-way. I got back 14 responses, and 13 were adamantly no. And as I explained before with the two-way, they have, they have, most of them are 200 kids, 130 or 40 kids in Lincoln County, and 200 kids are like me, 210 kids here and there. The only... I'm okay or in favor of it was one of our larger schools, Yarrington. So it was 13 to one against, and you know, Yarrington being one of our larger schools and biggest schools, I even had comments in those comments that are against Dayton that were asking questions about Yarrington. I explained that Yarrington's under the number that that's not part of the discussion. So anyway, just want the committee to know there is zero, well, one school supports uh, a school the size of Dayton coming anywhere near the two A because we're such a small classification we don't well, have a lot of schools at 400, just 200. That's just so with the committee notes. Yeah, yeah. And Bill, I want to be a little careful here because, again, uh, the, the committee's reaction is not meant uh, to, to be to a public comment. So I want to, anyway, you, you, you've said it and stated it. So just sorry, I just thought I'd no, no, okay. be aware. Yep. No, no, I understand. I understand. It's just, it's a little different process. And when you get into Robert's rules and orders and, and things like that. So we're okay. Let me say, uh, we, we do need to finish, finish the day with the opportunity for public comment. Um, Ron, Ron stepped away. Lori, do you have any other public comment that's been delivered to us? Ms. No, Lawson? I do not. Okay. I don't believe we need to read re, uh, really anything otherwise. So with that said, everybody, then last chance going once, going twice, public comment. I mean, um, sorry, committee comment. Yeah. Okay. Don, Donnie, Donnie, one more thing. I, uh, I, I know this is, the, the numbers are important in the 1A2. We want to hold to that those numbers. Uh, I know that the four uh, regions that, or divisions that we have are all adamant that we hold to those numbers. If you're over 170, you go. If you're under, you're you're in. So, just want to echo that sentiment. 
Yep. Thank you, Mr. Higby. Yeah, and, and Dr. Higby, we, we'll get into that uh, on March 8th. That'll be part of the procedures portion. So. All right, everybody, look at, thank you very much for all your time. Uh, and I realized we, we got technically two thirds of the way through, but uh, we've got really a good half of the information still to go in March and we'll get there. So it's a long process. Thanks everybody in the public has been listening. Appreciate you, your interest and you know how to commit to contact the committee members if you have other, other questions or comments as we go. With that said, everybody, please be well. Mm -hmm.